Good afternoon and welcome to our September 21st, 2021 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today. 
For those of us in person today, please remember that masks are required in this building. So we ask that you remain properly masked for the duration of this meeting. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on MCPS's website and MCPS TV. Before we officially begin the meeting, I would like to pause and honor our colleague, Mrs. Pat O'Neill. Today, we have the difficult task of opening this meeting with remembrances of our friend and colleague, Patricia O'Neill. As you may know, we unexpectedly lost Pat last week. Her passing shocked us all, and we have been grappling with our emotions all week. We never imagined that we would be starting this meeting today without her. Pat was the longest serving member of the board. She is a legend in this county. She was also our historian. We look to her to fill in the blanks and provide context on the board's practices, processes, and policies. She could recount all the battles won and lost she provided mentorship to each one of us as new board members. She offered institutional wisdom and stability. In addition to being a great colleague, she exemplified how to do this job with grace. She was kind, she was humble. She listened to her constituents and represented them well. But Pat's goal was to always make decisions that would benefit all students. From South Lake to Burning Tree, from Paint Branch to Poolsville, she served them all. And in the name of those principles, she was never afraid to stand for what she thought was right for students, even if it was unpopular. She exhibited unwavering courage. So while Pat's seat is empty today, and we feel the void in her absence. I know that she touched each one of us personally, and she left us with a rich legacy that we will never forget. I'm going to provide each board member an opportunity to say a few words. I'm first going to ask Dr. Daka to read the declaration that we have to present to Pat's family who are here today. Her spouse, Rick O'Neill, her daughters, Melissa O'Neill and Jennifer Schiffer, her sister, Dr. Carolyn O'Connor, and her dearest friend, Nancy King. So Dr. Daka, can I ask you to read yes. the proclamation at this time? I'm delighted to read the declaration. Whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill devoted her life's work to public education, having served on the Montgomery County Board of Education for 23 years, the longest in Montgomery County public schools history. She served as the board's president five times and as vice president six times. Whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill represented the students and school system of Montgomery County in many critical positions, including the past president to the Maryland uh, Association of Boards of Education and past co-chair of the Washington Area Boards of Education. And whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill led the board's policy management committee for many years, ensuring that the system's core values were embedded in its policy. She was instrumental in numerous transformative policy decisions, particularly codifying the school systems commitment to increasing access and opportunity for all students. Whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill served on numerous state-level advisory committees, including the Maryland Blue Ribbon Panel on Teen Pregnancy, the Maryland Comparable Task Force, and the Task Force for School Safety. Whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill was dedicated to the students and families of Montgomery County, standing for the values of equity, respect, relationship, learning, and excellence. And whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill earned numerous awards, including being named as one of the 100 most powerful women by the Washington, Washingtonian Magazine, 
And whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill served as the vice chair for the MCPS Educational Foundation and was a member of the foundation's grant committee, and whereas Mrs. Patricia O'Neill leaves a lasting legacy of service with grace to MCPS and Montgomery County. Now, therefore, be it declared that the Board of Education and the Montgomery County Public Schools honors and remembers Mrs. Patricia O'Neill for her outstanding work on behalf of the students and families of Montgomery County and joins with her family and the Montgomery County community in celebrating her life, her work, and her commitment in creating a more caring, equitable, and exceptional school system and county. And this is signed by Brenda Wolf, President, and Carla Silvestre, Vice President. Thank you, Dr. Docker. At this time, I'm gonna ask our board members to they would like to make a few comments, starting with Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think Pat, uh, we would all agree that Pat was more than a colleague. She was a friend. Um, when I first came on the board in 2012, Pat had already been serving for over a decade, and she was generous with her knowledge and her time. As chair of the policy committee, Pat mentored so many of us on the art of policy making and persuasion. <laughs> She remembered everything and used her arsenal of knowledge to help the school system craft policies on topics such as sex education, diversity, and procurement, among other things. She knew where the school system had been and was passionate about its future. And I think we can all agree she never shied away from a good argument. <laughs> um, she loved to debate the finer points of process and procedure. And while Pat and I were not always on the same side, of an argument that never mattered in the end. Um, when you spend so many hours together doing this work for a system that you both love, for a little recognition and even less money, you become like a family and are tied together by bonds that sometimes it's hard for people outside to understand. She spoke so often of her family and her friends. Um, you know, Rick, Jenny, Melissa, all her grandkids. Um, she would share at every meeting her adventures, um, her family's adventures, everything from soccer to her trips to London to field hockey, and very frequently figured out how to tie that into the work that she was doing at this job. She loved her job and she loved her family and was so proud of both. I think that stands out the most about her. Um, with Pat's passing for me, there will always be a seat missing at the table. And um, at this time, I would like to officially request that we add her name to the list of potential um, facilities uh, namings and um, want to just say to you all that I really hope you know that we are all here for you. No matter what, as time goes on, um, you will still always be part of our family, and um, we're very sorry for your loss. Ms. Silvestri. Um, thank you. Um, echo uh, Ms. Madrowski's comments. Um, I didn't know Pat O'Neill until I ran for office uh, three years ago and got to know her on the campaign trail as well as her um, supportive husband and family. Uh, but as soon as I got to know her, um, you know, she was very kind and um, had my best interest in mind. And uh, I always felt like I could go to her to ask her for advice. And uh, as she said, you know, I don't tweet. I don't do all that. Just pick up the phone and call me. And she would do that. She would call me and I would call her. Um, and... Um, you know, we are very sad to see her go. Um, you know, her legacy lives on. It lives on on everyone that she has mentored throughout the years, and it lives on in the children uh, of this school system. So um, I, I will miss her terribly, but um, she has done great work, and, and her legacy uh, lives on. So thank you. Ms. Evans. Sorry. 
I am still in shock. And Brenda called me to tell me that Pat had passed away. I said, Pat who? Because I was not thinking about Pat O'Neill. Um, it makes me think about our last conversation that we actually didn't have. Um, she said to me to give her a call so we can catch up. She had just come back from visiting Melissa. So I was very excited to hear her adventures, um, her s s small snippets. And she wanted to catch up to hear about um, dropping our oldest daughter off at college. You know, this, this job is difficult. And oftentimes people don't really know who we are. They get glimpses of us here at the board table. And what I can say about Pat O'Neill is that she used her head and her heart to do this work. Her heart, um, I, bl I believe everyone has said it. We heard a story about her, her grandchildren, her children, um, if not at every board meeting, definitely um, during our time together. And it helped inform um, her decisions. We also heard about her sister giving um, great advice because of her medical profession, right? So I always appreciated that. And Pat was the person, as you will hear, you will continue to hear, she was the go-to person. Pat could pull up something. She could tell you the history, the institutional knowledge quicker than you can pull it up on the computer. And so if I didn't know something, if I couldn't remember something, I always called Pat. Just really appreciate um, who she was as a board member, who she was as a person, I knew Pat prior to being on the board um, back in my years as being a cluster coordinator. So that goes back to 2010. So just really evaluate, appreciated and valued her friendship. And I'll just say thank you to Rick. You, um, you loaned us your wife for so many years. Really appreciate that. And I think about the difficulty that we have having children, having a husband, and finding that balance, that work-life balance. And um, Pat was always the person who would always make me feel good about if I needed to miss a meeting, go be with your family, that's important. We'll catch you up. So I'm really going to miss her. And then a personal thanks to Rick because he was always very supportive of me and my campaign, always putting out signs, Shepard, just come on over, bring him, leave him on the house, on the garage, and I'll get that what you need. And telling Pat to give me a call and tell Shepard something that she needs to think about. So I appreciate that. And just know if I ever do anything, I am going to call on you, Rick, for your help and your support, because um, you are uh, very helpful. And I just think about how you have been there for Pat. You've been there, you were there for your dad. I heard about how you take great care of your mother. You're just an all around great guy, great husband, great father. And Jenny and Melissa, I do not know you, but I feel like I do, <laughs> I really do. Um, and I just say that I will continue to keep you in my thoughts and prayers because as this was something that seemed sudden, that seemed so surreal for me, I can only imagine what you all are going through. And I'll tell you the one thing that does give me peace is that Pat was able to see you, Melissa, before um, she departed. She could not wait to go visit you and um, to plan the wedding. So very excited. And I'll say the one thing that um, you think about is, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, you do that. Because in spite of the times that we're living in now. Pat wanted to make certain that she remained safe, but also that she got to see her family, that she took care of that. And so it just gives me comfort that she was able to see you and that um, her grandkids were nearby and that she saw them on a regular basis. And um, I believe Ms. Mondrowski said it, we are here for you all and um, we will be in touch. And just so thank you so very much. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just can only echo all that my colleagues have said. Um, I found Pat to be a very kind and generous colleague and someone who um, was so very, very willing to spend whatever time you needed 
to think something through, to understand something better, to take a broader view. And I don't know how it was that she was so generous with all of her time, but she always was. She never made you feel like she had somewhere else to be, something else to do. Um, you know, the next thing was pressing. And I felt that welcome from her. Um, when I when I first came on the board, before I even began my service, she was the first one to call me and not only say congratulations, but also say, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be working together and anything I can do to help you. Um, in fact, she and I were working together um, to do what I hope will be very groundbreaking work in the system as we look to create a comprehensive sustainability policy. And she was passionate about that journey with me. And we plowed the road yesterday in the Fiscal Management Committee to honor her because we knew that's what she would want us to do. And so I, um, I also just can't help but comment on how everybody's talked about how hard Pat worked and her, 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 her continuous presence in the work of the school system. But she was also just one of the happiest people I know. She was so happy in her life and in her work, and that's a gift. And um, I admire her for the way she kept that balance and kept her eyes always focused on the things that were most important to her sitting in the front row and also used the joy she found there to influence the work that she did for the wider world. Ms. Um So as the youngest, newest member of the board, um, I only had the privilege of serving with Pat for around two months, which sounds impossible to hear because it feels like so much longer than that, especially when it's someone like Pat who took the time to genuinely get to know me, not just as a board member and not just as a colleague, but also as a student and as a friend. And Pat has given me more memories, more advice, more knowledge <laughs> to last a lifetime. Um, but one of the first um, conversations we had, actually before I was even sworn onto the board, um, she asked me about what I wanted to accomplish and what I've been hearing from students. And I told her, um, particularly about the 2021 graduates of MCPS who had so much taken away from them and had to adapt through so much. And then she shared with me her story of graduating in 1968, a very, very tumultuous year for the United States with who would soon become <laughs> her husband um, and having to adapt through a crazy year in our nation here. And she told me that if we could do it once, we could do it again. And I think it was that kind of not just knowledge and experience of living in Montgomery County, but also her optimism that she always brought to the board was so, so valuable. So um, I feel incredibly privileged um, to have known her and to have had this experience. Thank you. Dr. Docker, did you want to say anything else? Yes. Uh, I've neglected to show everybody the plaque, so I wanted you to see what I was reading from. Um, but. I also want to say just a few words uh, about Patricia, Pat, and um, I have to say to my Sora Shepherd, you did a really good job of talking about personal things in the family. Thank you for that. Uh, she was a voice of reason, reason and knowledge, and not just about board work, but about life in general. She was calm, judicious, gracious. Even in the face of the kind of adversity sometimes we had to face in Montgomery County Public Schools. And in general life situations, she was calm and always made good decisions. 
She was a face for equity and uh, for students, as was in the um, declaration. But Pat was my mentor when I came to the board 15 years ago. And we have been friends ever since, but she was just a fountain of knowledge and really helped me to make the adjustment from being a retired person to doing this. She was an advocate for all children and showed concern and compassion and appreciation for all of our staff. She was respected and admired by all of the superintendents with whom she served. She was a local leader even before her service on the board as president. Um, she was president of the PTA, and I think that's been mentioned several times. She was also a state leader, serving on various committees and as president of the Maryland Association Boards of Education, which represents our 24 counties. She was a national leader in national, nationwide conferences such as the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, and also in the National Organization of Boards of Education. She represented Montgomery County well. She was named as one of the 100 most influential women, and that's also in the Declaration for the State of Maryland. And uh, as president for five times and vice president for six times, unless you're here on the board, you do not know exactly how hard that work is. And I know that the presidents uh, understand that. They have to go everywhere. They have to meet with state leaders and local leaders, and they have to meet with communities and go to community centers and go to celebrations. It's an ordeal, but she was always able to do this with a graciousness. She was uh, dedicated and interacting with heads of organizations, local and state leasehold and citizens. She was a loving parent and grandparent, devoted and a great companion to her husband, Rick. Rick and Pat enjoyed many activities together. They traveled, and they also went to MGM Live. <laughs> <laughs> and other places that had things that you could do on machines. Pat and I spoke about 7.30, um, around 7.30 every morning, every other morning, after she spoke with a great friend who serves in the Maryland delegation, Senator Nancy King. Pat had many friends, and not all of them were in education. She was constantly asked to lunch or breakfast by someone each week. Every time you talk to Pat, she said, well, I'm having breakfast with this person. And they're not, they weren't all involved with education at all, so she had uh, a wide variety. Uh, our office staff has been very has been very kind and considerate to me and Pat because you know of our ADA and we've learned a lot of things and when we have to go to some of our buildings, they're old and they don't have the kind of accommodations that we really need. So we planned everything out and it was, um, it was, well, she had, a, she had a lot of insight as to the kinds of things we need to do and how this was going to work. Uh, on a personal note, note, note and because of our ADA, we did not shop anymore in stores very often. You know, like we used to go and look at clothing and accessories for the house and that kind of thing. We didn't do that. But we did use catalogs. <laughs> we always had mail whether we wanted it or not. Like at least twice a week, the mailbox is full of these things because all you'd have to do is order one thing and then you get, well, forever. Now, I just wanted to say that I'm wearing a shirt that Pat and I both purchased, unbeknownst to each other. <laughs> so I will be wearing this and always thinking of her when I do wear it and in, in the future. And she will be sorely missed. She was our knowledge. She was our historian and our reasonable person. So thank you so much for lending a, her to us for this long period of time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Before I turn the microphone over to Dr. McKnight, I'm going to come down and, and present the um, framed award. But I also have to say, I spoke to Pat most mornings. So right now, the morning is very hard. And so, Rick, you're going to have to take up her role of calling me. <laughs> 
every morning until I've been weaned off of this. But a, a short funny story is Rick called me on Sunday and the thing said, Pat O'Neill. I said, oh, Pat's calling me from the other side. <laughs> so I really appreciate your calls and I hope that you'll feel free to call anytime because I wanna find out about the wedding when Melissa gets married. And I love hearing about the grandkids because we had one the same age. So thank you and on behalf of the board, we want to make sure that you get this. Enter parking sign. Go to the mic, Rick. I mean, Rick, yeah. go to the mic so we all can hear you, so they can hear you too. Press the, wait, they're gonna come for sure. Fun's down there, oh, yeah. No, I was going to say that we've known each other. Uh, when we met uh, for graduation from Walter Johnson in 1968, I was uh, 18, she was only 17. She'd be 18 soon. Um, <laughs> You know, it's just been a great journey. Um, I don't think she ever dreamed she would have been on the school board. And I was just explaining to uh, uh, Jenny to tell her daughter that uh, Pat ran for student government at Walter Johnson, but didn't make it. Um, now she'd been at a different, she'd come back from California where her father had been transferred. But she just, she, Loved the campaigning, loved everyone, loved every one of you. Um, just no doubt about it. Thank you very much. This is just really very, very nice. Just very nice. We will treasure this. And anything we can do for you, let us know. You all have been so wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. McKnight. Thank you so much. Um, Rick, I must say, your strength mirrors Pat O'Neill's strength because what I have seen in you over the past few days um, just speaks to a testament of how you clearly both shared an energy of doing what you have to do. And today I see that energy that I've seen from her in over the years in you, and I thank you for that. Um, thank you, board members, for giving me the opportunity to speak and, again, our community. I'll start by saying I share my deepest sorrow on the passing of Ms. Patricia O'Neill. The impact of her loss is absolutely significant personally and professionally for me. This is my 20th year in Montgomery County Public Schools, and I came here as a second-year teacher. So my, the start of my career had the seat of Ms. O'Neill serving on the Board of Education. And so when I say that I've known her my entire career, that is simply exactly what it is. And with that said, I can't help but to reflect on the sacrifice of a public servant who serves 
for that length of time. So Rick, Jenny, Melissa, Pat's sister, Nancy, we know the sacrifice that she's made over the years to serve the students and families in Montgomery County Public Schools. And in some ways, I am sure that did sacrifice some of your time. So I thank you for sharing here with us because that has benefited the system and benefited children and families in so many ways in which we will see today and we will see for years to come. So we thank you for that because you truly are the foundation as the family of one who serves to provide service to others. As we sit here at our board meeting today and continue the system's work, we look down and I'm reminded that there's an empty chair on that dais. And I believe all of us will continue to just take some time to reflect and use the wisdom and insight that Pat O'Neill have provided for us over the years. Just a couple of weeks ago, I looked down about five times and I saw her beverage sitting there. And I said, did she leave? Did she leave? And I kept thinking just her opinion, just her feedback in the conversation would be missed. It'll be missed today. It'll be missed at our next board meeting. It will be missed moving forward because of what she represented and her unwavering support to the school system over the years. In many ways, this will also be one important part of Pat's legacy, I'll say. She leaves with us the ability to really think about how all of the decisions that we make have to be embedded in our students and our families and her expectations that we would always, as a system, focus on the students and staff. And she modeled that consistently and unwavering as a board member. So because of that, I'll say that we're so much better and farther along as a school system because of her leadership. And I and many others are grateful for that. There's so much more that Pat accomplished um, highlights in her career dedicated to the students of Montgomery County. She was the longest serving board member in the history, in the history of Montgomery County. Again, I speak about that because it's sacrifice. And we all said that she truly was an unofficial historian. One day she said to me, Monifa, I don't want you to think that um, I'm giving you too much information. I said, Pat, there's no such thing. You have all of the information. And I need it all, so please don't ever say that. Um, but again, to know that she has so much history, but to present it in a way that says, I'm here for you if you need me, was just who she was. Um, and I so appreciate that uh, because, because of that, we were able to make so many connections to the work and lessons learned in building the future from what she was able to add from all of her years in the past in which she served. She served on a number of different committees and work groups um, and always just represented herself as an effective leader. She was the past president of the Maryland Association of Board of Education and the past co-chair of the Washington Area Boards of Education. These are just a few examples that share how much she gave to education in Montgomery County and in the state of Maryland. I have to say, although Pat's term would have been up next year, I suspect that she very likely would have wanted to continue this work. <laughs> knowing who she is and what she represented. And such is the nature of dedication of Pat O'Neill. She is a legend and I am honored to have spent the time that I have spent with her. And thank you so much again for sharing her with all of Montgomery County Public Schools. So with that said, we as a school system also wanted to honor Pat in a very special way. She was a beautiful person inside and out. And I wanna thank our MCPS TV crew who have uh, produced a video that is a small, truly small reflection of the work that she contributed to the school system um, in a lifetime of work that includes comments from people, community members, and others who are sharing their thoughts about Pat. So it would be my honor for us to introduce this video and share this video with you today. 
Could you play the video, please? As a board member, I feel a maternal responsibility to all 165,000 children in Montgomery County. Pat O'Neill, tireless leader, dedicated mentor, respected colleague, and trusted friend. During her 23 years on the Board of Education, the longest tenure of any board member, Pat distinguished herself as a policy wonk, happy to dig into the details, but never losing sight of the big picture. She led with determination, calmly, but fiercely advocating for all children, especially the most vulnerable. Pat was proud of her MCPS roots and loved this school system and the board on which she served with unapologetic passion. She leaves behind a family who loved her and a community that admired her. What I admired most about Pat O'Neill was everything. Her tenacity, her drive, her leadership, and I think perhaps uh, most of all, how genuine she was, she would tell you exactly what she was thinking and she would tell it to you with true conviction. I've worked with hundreds of board members and spent thousands of hours with board meetings. I've never seen anybody quite as comprehensive as Pat O'Neill. She loved not only children and all children, but she loved all the parents. She had no special issues. She loved all of the issues. And she was a great historian and had a good mind. She understood both the minutia of the work, but also uh, could personalize it because she could relate to the needs of families and students. And she was always a reminder that, uh, you know, regardless of, of budget and size and diversity, we we still had a responsibility to, to all of the children and their families and the community. Everywhere you look at it, she's been an incredibly important person in the history of Montgomery County Public Schools. If I had to use one word to describe Pat O'Neill, it would be brilliant. I would uh, use the word warrior. She was an equity warrior. It would be historian. Class. She was a classy lady. It would be love. Love is the all-encompassing thing that she brought to this board and she brought to this community. She brought to the family, her grandchildren, and all children within the boundaries of Montgomery County and indeed the country.
which makes me sad uh, and at the same time so proud. And it just shows, I mean, what a great board this is, what great staff, the, the media crew, it's just absolutely incredible. Paul was just helping us every step of the way and love the new photo of the board. It's a just fantastic. You all do such a great job. Our family is so appreciative. We, we miss her greatly. This, on the one hand, I want to cry when I see this, but it, we're so proud. Um, proud of her, proud of the board and everything that's done and the staff. Just so great, really nice. Nancy, such a friend, and so many friends. She had so many friends. We thank you very much, um, very much. Anything we can ever do for you, let us know. You've done much for us. We didn't mind lending her at all. It's just, it's sad. I mean, as I said, it, it's just incredible that she passed while watching the Montgomery County Council in preparation for the the Zoom meeting with the Board of Education. I mean, she was just very committed. Um, we dearly love her, I know. We dearly love all of you, and she dearly loved you all. I mean, really did, just, it was her life. We thank you very much, our entire family. Thank you so much, and we will just treasure the proclamation. It is just special, Judy, just very special. Thank you all very much for having us. And good luck, carry on, and you, you all have a very difficult job. I'm, I'm more aware of that than uh, most people. So thank you very much for all of your very kind comments, too. Just very, very kind. Thank you. Thank you. And to Pat's family, thank you for sharing her with us for 23 years. So. Now Pat would want us to continue, so we will. Let us begin the business meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I will call the roll now to recognize a quorum, starting with Dr. Daka. Judy Daka, present. Ms. Mondrowski. Good afternoon, Rebecca Mondrowski. Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon. Ms. Evans. I'm here. Ms. Harris. Good afternoon. Ms. Aluni. Good afternoon. Now can I get an approval of the agenda? Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Okay, at this time we're at recognitions. Item three, Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Pre <clears throat> Thank you President Wolf, and uh, good afternoon again, board members and to our community members who are joining us today. I do have a few recognitions that I bring forward. Uh, the first being our uh, recognition for a walk to school day. Safe pedestrian skills are critical for both children and adults. Walking to school enables children to incorporate daily physical activity while also forming healthy habits that may last a lifetime. Walking to school helps reduce the amount of air pollutants emitted by vehicles. An international walk to school day is celebrated by thousands of schools all, across all 50 states, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and in more than 40 countries worldwide. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools proclaim October 6, 2021 as Walk to School Day, and be it further resolved that the board, that the school system notify the public and school community of Walk to School Day publicized this resolution and the school system's participation through internal and external communications and encourage everyone to consider the safety of pedestrians and in particular student walkers and bicyclists every day. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. 
That is unanimous. Thank you. Our next recognition is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month in the United States. The official theme for the observance, America's Recovery, powered by inclusion, reflects the importance of ensuring that people with disabilities have full access to employment and community involvement during the national recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Montgomery County Public Schools, as part of the National Disability Employment Awareness Month, recognizes the importance of embracing inclusive practices and policies that promote the benefits of a diverse workforce that includes individuals with disabilities who represent a highly motivated and talented workforce pool. Montgomery County Public Schools holds the core values that each and every student matters. Outcomes should not be predictable by race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Equity demands the elimination of all gaps and creating and maximizing future opportunities for students and staff as necessary. Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to partnering with families to support student academic success and social emotional well-being. Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools declare the month of October as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and encourage staff members in schools to sponsor and participate in activities in honor of its recognition. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Our next resolution is Maryland Family Engagement Month, October 2021. This year's theme for Maryland Family Engagement Month is Building Back Together, Reimagining Family Engagement. More than five decades of research continues to demonstrate that family engagement is a powerful influence on student achievement and success, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or a parent's guardian's level of education. We recognize the essential role families play in supporting positive outcomes for student achievement and well-being, and in the pursuit of ensuring every student has the academic problem solving and social emotional skills to be successful in school, college, and career. Families and educators and community members work together as partners, hold themselves mutually accountable, and have the knowledge, skills, and confidence to succeed at improving education for all students. Montgomery County Public Schools provides opportunities for parents and guardians to engage with school system staff by attending back-to-school night events, parent-teacher conferences, various school and school system activities, and also encourages involvement with the Montgomery County Council of Parent-Teacher Associations and Corporation, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Parents Council, and other parent organizations. Montgomery County Public Schools this year connects with families through Synergy, Parent View, Montgomery County Public Schools Television Channel 34, social media, and information sent home from the school. Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of October 2021 to be Maryland Family Engagement Month and encourage parents, guardians, students, staff, and community members to recognize the importance of the home school partnership to improve student learning. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. And our final recognition is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to preventing domestic violence by educating students, staff, and community and joining advocacy organizations to raise awareness. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence is designated and the United States Congress has officially recognized October as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month to educate and inform the public about domestic violence, to encourage all to speak up about domestic violence, to raise awareness about domestic violence, support survivors of domestic violence, advocate for resources, prevention programs, and education programs. Every nine seconds, a woman in the United States is beaten or assaulted by a current or ex-partner, and over 10 million adults experience domestic violence annually. One in every four women and one in every seven men have experienced significant physical violence by an intimate partner. Domestic violence has significant impact on survivors, including physical injuries, trauma, and even death. 
Domestic violence is estimated to cost $8.3 billion per year in the United States. One in every 15 children are exposed to domestic violence each year, with approximately 90% having witnessed this violence firsthand. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby proclaim October 2021 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and recommend observance to all of our school communities. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Our next item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of the opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy program and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper, proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. With this board meeting, we have resumed live public comments and have five persons signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the podium Please keep your mask on, but speak clearly and directly into the microphone. Your mask should be properly worn over your nose and mouth. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have two audio testimony and nine video presentations. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. So, so let us begin. Our first speaker is June Trakoff. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. June Trakoff, parent of two MCPS students. Today, I request you to please focus on and prioritize three issues related to COVID quarantine, contact tracing, testing, and instruction. One, do real contact tracing. Stop quarantining whole classrooms, lunchrooms, and playgrounds as a default for convenience. This indicates insufficient training or use of mitigation strategies like assigned seating. And it is needlessly overwhelming and overburdening local pediatrician offices. Be like Sacramento with four close contacts per case, not like Los Angeles with 500 close contacts per case. Two, do test to stay. Close contacts of a child who tested positive for COVID stay in school and are tested periodically with a rapid test, like the state-provided Abbott by Next Now tests, which are the gold standard for international travelers entering the U.S. As long as a child tests negative, they stay in school. If they test positive, they go home. See the Massachusetts plan as one example. Copy it instead of reinventing the wheel. Three, provide instruction during quarantine. Secondary school has zero. Students are given assignments to figure out on their own and come to teacher office hours with questions. Let students watch their classes via live stream at a bare minimum. Let them learn. You're smart people and know to do these things. Parents shouldn't need to come here and tell you this. 
Yet the BOE and leadership of MCPS, MCEA, PTA, and County Council have shown a culture of behavior to obstruct, confuse, delay, avoid, and make excuses. I get that it has worked for you for a long, long time, but now there are a lot more parents paying a lot more attention. Enough. Put students first. Operate from a position of keeping students in school, not promoting de facto shutdowns. Fix the quarantine issues of contact tracing, testing, and instruction. You have ample resources. Get it done. Cut the crap. Thank you. Next up is Susanna Montezé Malo. Thank you, and you did great with my name. No one ever does it, so thanks. Um, so I'm the parent of one of more than 3,400 MCPS students who's been quarantined in the first three weeks of school. I want to talk a little bit, but, bit about this to explain why I really hope that you'll minimize quarantines. Her entire math class and her math teacher's entire homeroom class were both quarantined. It was about 40 students. Um, and even though she tested negative on day five and many of her uh, fellow classmates did, they were not allowed back at school for the full 10 days. Today is her first day back. Um, I'm really hoping that the board and MCPS will take some leadership to adopt and implement the state's definition of close contact. Right now I'm concerned that MCPS isn't even enforcing its own definition, that it should be within six feet when they're by default quarantining everyone. But we have a mask mandate, it's working really well. Why aren't we using the three foot definition um, that the state has? Also, like June, I support a test to stay program. I grew up in Massachusetts, have lots of friends and family there, and it's working really well. If somebody tests positive in the class, close contacts are able to take a test on site each day, and if they test negative, they can attend. Um, this has led to much lower levels of quarantine. Finally, I know virtual school is hard to do in a pandemic, but this year it has been especially challenging. Just to give you a sense of what happened to my daughter last week in school, um, unlike last year where she had 20 students in class, she had about 40 because they combined two classes into one. So that was really challenging for the teacher. The students didn't have any workbooks, so they were trying to navigate everything online. I wasn't allowed to pick up her workbooks from school. Nothing was posted on Canvas, so I couldn't provide support. And one day there was a substitute who did not know how to use Zoom, and I'm not kidding. I heard her yelling up there, share your screen, share your screen. She didn't know. This poor substitute, I feel for her. But this is not what our students deserve. We can do better. We can follow reasonable quarantine guidance and implement test to state. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Reisman. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jennifer Reisman. I'm a psychologist and a parent of an MCPS student. I'm here today to ask you to do four things. First, immediately implement revised quarantine guidance that places only close contacts into quarantine. End the practice of placing entire classrooms into quarantine immediately. Allow children that you placed into quarantine when a single child developed a headache to return to their classrooms immediately. Secondly, implement a test to stay protocol where students who are an identified close contact of a child would be allowed to attend school unless they test positive or develop symptoms. Massachusetts and other states and districts have written the protocols and procedures for you. Myself and other advocates have offered repeatedly to put you in touch and in contact with experts in other areas. Just do it. Thirdly, end the instructional desert that is quarantine. I remind you that in Maryland, truancy is defined as missing more than eight days in a quarter. There were exactly zero days of meaningful instruction to provide it to my sixth grader on quarantine. In my mind, you forced my child to be truant. There is a strong body of literature to show you that you have altered the educational trajectories of the children that you have put into the state-sanctioned truancy that you call quarantine. These absences are related to increased risk of dropping out, expulsion, and substance use. Fourth, why have you as a Board of Education not called upon MCPS to report in aggregate the MAP score results? Why have you completely abandoned your oversight duties to the education that children are receiving here? 
What are you afraid of and what are you hiding? Release the map data in aggregate so we can begin to reckon with the negative impact of prolonged virtual instruction. If you cannot do any of these four things and you cannot bring yourself to a way to find to keep children in schools, perhaps you should not be sitting in these seats and should resign. Next up is Kara McNulty. Hello, my name is Kara McNulty and I'm the parent of two students in MCPS. My family moved here in 2019 and we strongly regret moving to Montgomery County. I was under the impression that this was an excellent school district. My family's experience tells me this is not the case. The two other districts we have lived in, in Pennsylvania and in Canada, had substantially more live instruction in the last school year. But of course you know that because you know that MCPS provided less live instruction than almost every district in the developed world, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe. And it is well documented that virtual instruction is ineffective and in many ways harmful to students. I am here today to ask you, how important is it for you to have students in schools? Your primary objective, to use your own words from your vision statement, is to inspire learning by providing the greatest public education to each and every student. That is a laudable objective. But over the last 18 months and continuing today, you haven't done that. Today, perhaps in the next agenda topic, you will share with us the impact of virtual learning on the educational progress of the 160,000 students you have in your care. So I return to my question, how important is it for you to have students in schools? Right now, it does not seem that important. You have quarantined over 3,000 students based on 100 to 200 positive tests. I don't have good data because your transparency is quite poor, and you've done none of the planning to have basic, well understood test and trace procedures in place. You have been frantically struggling to recover from your lack of planning. I urge you to implement test to stay as described by the other parents who have testified. This can minimize disruption, is scientifically based, Thank and you. can we allow you to return testimony. students to schools. Thank you. Jerry Fleming. Do I have to wait for the green light? Or? Okay. All right, so um, I'm a mother of a high school student in Montgomery County, and he wants to play the fall sports. And so there's a new vac uh, vaccine mandate. I uh, need a vaccine by 11:15, and uh, so I provided my materials a lot of links to, um, you know, articles, videos about um, adverse effects, especially for young kids with especially heart issues. And so you can see that shortness of breath, uh, myocarditis, a uh, permanent heart damage. Uh, one in a thousand can get this. So, um, you know, I'm just worried that you're going to have a bunch of students coming in or parents coming in come, you know, December or something saying, oh my God, you know, well, this happened. Why did you um, mandate this? And I'm providing you then information so you can see that there are risks. Now, you might feel that there's some disinformation here, you know, the risk. So the first thing I put in there, the first link is from the FDA meeting that happened Friday when they were um, assessing the Pfizer boosters, and that was voted down 16 to 3. So if you go to that YouTube, you can hear the actual um, Zoom meeting, and what they did is they had lots of doctors, had the two, three-minute thing like you have here to say what they found in the current vaccines, and so you're going to be, you know, concerned of what you hear and why I think the boosters were declined 16 to 3. Um, also, I presented information on Israel um, where there's lots of people vaccinated, but the vaccinated people are, are getting a COVID anyway. So I'm just asking you to drop that vaccine mandate. I'm really worried about the kids. I'm worried about you parents coming back and saying, why did you do this? So please look at the information here and you know maybe work it back and just wait for more information to come out thank you thank you we received two audio testimonies first up is samantha neville please play the video play play the audio 
Hi, my name is Samantha Neville. I'm a parent of a first grader and third grader at Little Bennett Elementary School in Clarksburg, Maryland. I do want to thank you for um, taking the time to listen in today to my concerns regarding quarantine safety measures um, in regards to COVID-19. On September 3rd, my first grader was required to quarantine at home for 10 days because a sick child came to school with COVID-19 um, symptoms, later tested positive. Um, I also have a third grader, as I mentioned, who was not required to quarantine um, because she did not have any direct exposure at school. Now, had my first grader possibly been exposed to COVID due to the sick child in her class, that means my daughter, who resides in the same home, obviously would have also been directly exposed. Ultimately, we were tested. Uh, we all tested negative. However, I did choose to keep my third grader at home uh, because I can't possibly leave a sixth grader, a six year old at home for virtual learning and take a third grader to school. Uh, that's not logistically possible. And so my frustration definitely stems from a lack of planning within Little Bennett Elementary and also within the state of Maryland regarding the safety of our children. I also don't understand why we're not implementing temperature checks as opposed to simply buying testing kits. It takes less money to purchase a thermometer than it does an actual testing kit for COVID. So that makes absolutely no sense to me. And I've also voiced my concerns with Governor Hogan's office as well as fellow parents who have the same concerns as I do. There are also no partitions in the lunchrooms or classrooms to keep the students at least six feet apart. They're not sitting six feet apart. There are far too many inconsistencies in the way that we're managing this issue, and I would like some viable solutions to be provided. Thank you for Next step is Deanna Ricks. Please play the audio. Good afternoon, members of the Board of Education, and happy Hispanic Heritage Month. My name is Deona Ricks. I'm in my 30th year of teaching with MCPS. I currently teach ESOL at Jackson Road Elementary School. I am also the chair of the MCEA Minority Affairs Committee. COVID-19 has disrupted education for all of our students. Nevertheless, students, families, and staff continue to de demonstrate resilience during these unprecedented times. Students in highly impacted and systemically neglected areas have been hit the hardest. As a result, the opportunities for learning that already existed continue to widen in what is often characterized as the other Montgomery County. But we are one Montgomery County. The investment in education from the American Rescue Plan and the Blueprint for Maryland's Future provides MCPS with unique opportunities to address these inequities that exist. The ARP provides thousands of dollars in additional funds per student. We must ensure that these funds are used on resources, services, and staffing in communities that are impacted the most. It's a matter of equity. We should be very intentional about where and how ARP funds are allocated. I ask that those who are closest to the work, teachers, be an integral part of these decisions. One example would be to connect with the community school liaisons to discuss innovative ways of how we can provide wraparound services and support for our students. In addition, we must be accountable by providing multiple opportunities for transparent progress checks and firsthand feedback from stakeholders. Together, let's build one Montgomery County and a better MCPS. Si se puede. Yes, we can. Thank you. We also received nine video testimonies. First up is Cynthia Simonson. Board of Education, Cynthia Simonson, MCCPTA president. First, I want to pay our respects to Pat O'Neill and honor her years of service. Certainly, our students lost one of their greatest supporters last week. As we begin our fourth week of the school year, there are unanswered questions that I'd like the board to consider. First, we are hearing very uneven reports from staff. We need the board to clarify if symptomatic staff are able to access the rapid tests, and if not, why not? Also, if they're not able to access those tests, 
Are there other parts of the June 30th guidebook that MCPS is also eliminating from the MCPS approach? Second, we'd ask that you please provide notification to families when there is a child that tests positive for COVID or has symptoms but refuses testing. Parents should be aware, even if their child wasn't considered a close contact, so that they can be on alert for any symptoms and to get their child tested periodically if they so choose. Third, as we talk about students in quarantine, I recently heard an elementary school principal make a very compelling argument for why it would make sense for a central office individual to teach students in quarantine, anticipating that with similar pacing, all of our schools are within a day or two of each other anyway. Then hearing a central office individual respond, it simply isn't possible. That has to be handled by the school-based staff. Please ask about the efficiency of having staff development and reading specialists trying to support one or two kids per day each day versus having one central office staff person with 15 or 20 at a certain grade level. And finally, as we talk about the morning routines at schools, please consider my earlier appeal from the operating budget testimony to dispatch central office staff to our schools. The administrators need assistance, and I believe the MCPS central office staff, office staff are the best suited to provide that support. Thank you so much for your time. Next is Michelle Wong. Please play the- Hello, Board of Education members. I'd like to begin by offering my condolences for the loss of board member Ms. O'Neill and to thank you all for your dedication to the students in our county. My name is Michelle Wong. I'm a junior at Richard Montgomery High School and chief of staff of the Montgomery County Regional SGA. I'm here today to advocate on behalf of MCR for greener schools and facilities. MCPS has done a wonderful job with transitioning towards green transportation but our facilities are still reliant on non-renewable energy sources. Maryland House Bill 630 requires all school districts in the state to update their energy policies by July 1st, 2022. This is a tremendous opportunity to invest in green schools. They have obvious health and environmental benefits, but also educational ones. As we switch over to more efficient schools, we can invest the money saved into students and their learning. Our buildings would become exemplars of STEM and social studies concepts in action. And so we're asking for the board to allocate more funding towards green schools and facilities and make green infrastructure a priority to meet the county's climate action plan goals. A United Nations IPCC report that came out in August reaffirmed that humans cause climate change and that the window to act is closing quickly. This is incredibly distressing news for myself as well as many students in the county. We can't predict the future. We don't know how livable our homes will be in just a few years. Flooding from Hurricane Ida has already deeply affected my own school community, and extreme weather events like that will only get worse. All of this causes a lot of uncertainty. But one thing is certain that we have to fight for a cleaner future for all of us. Thank you. Next is Mahi Kunavar. Hello, Board of Education members. My condolences for the recent loss of Board of Education member Mrs. O'Neill, and I thank her and you for your commitment to the students in MCPS. My name is Mahi Kunvar and I am a student at Northwest High School. I'm here today as the treasurer of MCRSGA to urge the Board of Education to reallocate more funds towards green schools, as well as act upon the Climate Action and Thrive 2050 plans for the 2023 and 2024 school year. We as the youth of Montgomery County are sizable stakeholders due to the effects of climate change being left to our generation to resolve. Global temperatures have been on a rise due to past and ongoing greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change is a growing risk to all of us, and this cannot continue. Statistics show that gross greenhouse gas emissions in Montgomery County were significantly higher in 2020 than in 2017 and 2006, in all sectors contributing to climate change. As of the 2019 year, out of the 208 schools in MCPS, 122 schools have yet to be certified as green schools. The County Council's Climate Action Plan has set a target for 50% of MCPS schools to become green schools within the next three years, but the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan does not currently require specific actionable steps to contribute to these goals. 
Maryland HB 630 requires all school districts in the state to update their energy policies by July 1st of 2022. This is an opportunity for us to invest in green schools and make a change in our environment. I think about climate change every day in simple things like when I'm walking outside and when I'm using electricity in my home. Youth are afraid for our future and look to our policymakers to help bring about the change needed to save our environment. To reiterate, I am urging the Board of Education to act upon the Climate Action Plan and reallocate our funds towards green facilities and climate recovery. Thank you for your time. Next is Alatus Barnes. Hello, I'm Alatus Barnes, a senior at Walt Whitman High School. I've seen over the course of the pandemic how hard our school has been working to provide food at our cafeteria for all students. I've also seen the promises that MCPS have has made in regards to green energy in seeking an 80% reduction of emissions by 2027, as well as creating work groups centered around community engagement and adaptation to our changing climate. However, I feel that there is more that can be done. The food at my school's cafeteria is either heavily processed French toast sticks, cheese and pepperoni pizzas and french fries, or sliced carrots and apple slices that come in plastic packages. Our food isn't fresh or home cooked, or has any semblance of being from the earth. Beyond the harm that this diet may have on our physical health, there is harm in transporting this food in trucks and vans to schools across our county. Science is increasingly becoming aware of the carbon footprint embedded in our industrial agriculture. Every calorie consumed by an MCPS student has a carbon footprint. I feel we need to look deeper at this issue and analyze the amount of emissions that are coming from transport of these resources by fostering relationships with local food businesses and working to incorporate school gardens and cooking classes into our school day, there's a great opportunity for positive change in our school system. Students deserve the right to have access to fresh and local food and to see where that food comes from. If school isn't the place to learn how to live and interact with the world, then what is its purpose? Students also deserve the right to breathe natural air and not have asthma and other breathing problems exacerbated by county emissions. If school is in a healthy and nurturing place for students to study, then what is its purpose? To the extent that this is a more costly enterprise, I beg you to consider the cost of medical bills of our future students if healthy eating habits and foods are not made more easily available. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Next is Brianna Akumwa Boating. Good afternoon, Board of Education. My name is Brianna Kumo Boating, and I'm a sophomore at Pozo High School in the Global Ecology Program. I would like to begin my testimony by giving my condolences in regards to the loss of Ms. O'Neill. While I commend MCPS for the successful installation of water bottle filling stations, we need to keep the momentum going. The climate action plan is still lacking in a lot of its actions, and we don't have time to wait for change. We need to drastically change how we use energy if we have any intention of meeting our 2027 goal. And green schools are a great way to start. As I've mentioned in the past, converting conventional models to green schools would allow us to save one third of our energy and water usage in each school, making them a much more cost-effective and sustainable option. MCPS needs to prioritize green schools not only for their budgetary savings, but also for the well-being of students and staff. Many of our schools are falling apart due to infrastructure needs that aren't being addressed, making schools a place of discomfort and unease. But the Green School model promotes a clean and fresh environment that has been shown to increase student engagement and success while coming at a lower need of maintenance. Every time students testify, many of you will say that children are the future. And as a future, we are the ones who will be dealing with the consequences of climate change. Your position gives you the obligation to fight for us and support us, so please be bold and protect us. Thank you for your time. Next is Valencia Bednar. Hi, can't see you there. Can I tell you a secret? You're on CPS. My name is Valencia Bednar and I'm eight years old. I live in Maryland, but I was born in Seattle, Washington. I go to school at Rock Creek Forest and I'm speaking with you because there is a lot of pollution in the air. I might see a change to clean electricity because one, I don't want you to lose money when everyone smells the pollution from the coal power plants. If you guys want us to grow up 
and go to college and discover stuff, then animals should be around. And if the climate pollution did kill all the animals, then I blame it 50% on the real electricity. Please choose clean energy for MCPS students. Bye. Next is R.T. Ungruwal. Respected board members, my name is R.T. Agarwal and I'm a parent of a kindergartner at Wilson Wimps Elementary. My intent here today is to share some real-time experience from parents and teachers from the start of the school year. I'll start with my home school. Last week, a kindergarten student at Wimps was reported positive and the whole class, including the teacher, was given less than 24-hour notice to go home to 10 days quarantine and start virtual learning. My daughter was accepted in virtual academy, but I declined it because of my work schedule, as I usually have back-to-back -back meetings sometimes. If a case is reported in my daughter's class, it'll be tough for me to start virtual learning on a very short notice. This is the situation for most parents who are working full-time. This is very unpractical and inconsiderate way of isolating and quarantining students and teachers when a case is reported. It puts both teachers and parents in a very tough and challenging situation. My suggestion is immediately initiate weekly testing, daily temperature checks, daily screenings, social distancing, and anything else that worked successfully in the past. I've learned from parents, teachers, and my own experience that three feet distance requirement is not being followed through. At WIMS, kindergarten classes are below capacity and ensuring this requirement is met is feasible, but they're not doing it and I don't know why. If they would have put proper markings for each student or provide each student their own desk, the whole class, including the teacher, would have not been required to quarantine and do virtual learning for 10 days. I have more experiences, suggestions, and questions in my written testnet. I would greatly appreciate if you could read through them and provide your proper feedback and guidance. And thank you for your time today. Next is Sheila Zia. Crazy. My name is Sheila Zaya Craigie. I'm the mother of an MCPS first grader and the spouse of an MCPS teacher. I'm also a licensed professional engineer and an exposure scientist. Ventilation and air quality have become foremost concerns in this age of COVID. In addressing these concerns, we have an opportunity to make meaningful changes that will support a healthy environment long term beyond COVID for MCPS students and staff. CO2 or carbon monoxide is a marker of air quality and ventilation in relation to occupancy. So outdoor levels have, um, outdoor air is a level about 400 and the average exhale is a level about 40,000 ppm. So when levels climb into the thousands, above 4,000, we're now talking about indoor air that may be 10% of someone's exhale. For many reasons, air quality experts have historically aimed to keep levels below 1,000 ppm. You can measure this key indicator with a carbon dioxide meter for $200. Uh, not to be confused with a carbon monoxide meter, which you should have in your home, nor unfortunately cheap in knockoffs on the internet. Um, maintenance staff, maintenance IAQ staff cannot spend a full day in every occupied classroom, but these can. One of these in each school, shared across classrooms, can be used to identify problems, areas, or reassure concerned stakeholders of healthy conditions. Scientists, parents, and journalists are sending these into classrooms with their students around the country, finding both comfort and concern. MCPS can get in front of this, just like other institutions that are monitoring their own air quality. I urge MCPS to invest in these meters, use them widely, share the data, Teachers can see real-time impacts of an open door and open window, and all of us can relax as it's warranted and focus where on those specific microenvironments where there's unhealthy conditions. Our final video comes from Brad Shear. My name is Brad Shear, and I'm a parent of two MCPS students. Since March 13, 2020, this board has put partisan politics ahead of student needs, refused to follow science and common sense, and ignored facts. I'm here to talk about the BOE's continuing refusal to accept facts and hide the truth from students and parents by silencing free speech. 
On September 10th, the BOE sent out a disappointing message about the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks. It said in part, let us reject the urge to assign blame and point fingers. According to the 9-11 Commission report, Islamic terrorists associated with the Al-Qaeda organization planned and carried out the attacks. On 9-11, I heard American Airlines Flight 11 hit the North Tower and watched United Airlines Flight 175 hit the South Tower. That morning, I ran for my life, and for the past 20 years, our country has been fighting militant Islamic terrorists who are trying to destroy our country. So don't tell us not to blame those responsible, because 9-11 dramatically changed my life and the lives of countless others. These are facts. Another fact is that this BOE is violating our First Amendment rights. At the January 28th meeting this year, 13 of 14 speakers heavily criticized the BOE for its illogical decisions regarding opening our schools to in-person learning. Afterward, the BOE moved in secret to destroy transparency and accountability by changing its public speaking rules to silence students and parents whose opinions they don't like while giving the teachers union and other favored groups speaking slots at every single meeting. My MPI request to obtain documents regarding the public speaking rules changes had been met with redacted, worthless, non-responsive documents. The recent quarantine rules fiasco, which flouted CDC and state guidelines, prove why public speaking rules must not be used to muzzle students and parents. Schools need to also stop banning kids who cough due to allergies. The continuing inept behavior by this BOE proves that every member who has been in office since March 13, 2020 needs to resign. To ensure legitimacy, this BOE must not engage a new superintendent until after the next election. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Tuesday, October the 5th. Sign-ups for public comment will open the evening of Tuesday, September 28th. Next, we're up to item number five, so I'll ask Dr. McKnight to proceed. Okay. Thank you, uh, President Wolf. So we will begin with our presentation. I'll ask the team to join the table. So good afternoon. Board of Education members, I am pleased to be joined here with the Montgomery County Public Schools team who will provide a very important update today on our equity accountability framework evidence of learning and the work we're doing to reach the goals outlined in this plan. This is a very important discussion that we're having today because this is the first time in over 18 months that we have been able to come forward and actually share information with you regarding one of the largest topics that we've been discussing since this pandemic, and that is how have our students' learning been impacted over the last 18 months? And today we'll have an opportunity to delve into the data to see exactly what that looks like. The framework for evidence of learning, I will say, is not new. It is uh, definitely based on the premise of the all-means-all approach to student success. So that means looking at every single student individually and thinking about what the impact of learning has been on them individually and being very specific about how we are addressing those needs. With that said, there are several commitments that we have to continue to make and even most importantly make them as a result of all the data that we're gonna look at today. One being that we've got to continue to address disparities in student outcomes by closing opportunity and achievement gaps for all of our students in all of our classrooms and in all of our schools. It would be great if we could sit here and say that there was a place in which none of this exists, but we know that is not the case. And so that's why we have the responsibility to look at the data that tells the story that then prompts us to action and to respond. The MCPS Equity and Achievement Framework provides the purpose, path, and plan to ensure student success. And it ensures very specifically our commitment to the very first part of PROSPER 100, which is students first. The approach has to be that in order for our students to prosper and to put them first, we actually have to know what are the everyday efforts that we're going to put in place for them and their learning. A very important conversation we have to have right now, because as we still continue to navigate the needs of this pandemic, while we think about everything that's needed in providing our students a healthy and safe environment to learn, we have to ensure that learning is still occurring for all of our students. So today in our presentation, we're gonna provide information and data about the first part of the framework, evidence of learning. We're also gonna share our progress in ensuring students are college and career ready when they leave Montgomery County Public Schools. 
As we share and reflect on the data, it is clear that the pandemic has resulted in a significant learning disruption over the past 18 months. I'm going to say that up front, and it should not be new information, because last year, we identified that as our main priority in our budget and said, we want to put our resources in place, assuming that learning was disrupted by the pandemic. Today, we're going to see exactly what that looks like. I also want to say that it's very important that we assess where we are cur currently and determine the next steps that are put in place to best meet the needs of our individual student. And I emphasize individual student because this is really going to require all hands on deck and us being very intentional and specific to one, know each learner, to know them well, to know what their learning needs are, and to address them. And that has to happen in every classroom, with every child, in every school throughout this entire system. It is what they deserve, it is what we owe them, particularly knowing that their lives in ways that none of us could have imagined have been disrupted over the past 18 months. So today, as we share that, we're also going to just navigate and talk about some of the mitigating learning disruption um, that we've been discussing in our district strategic initiatives implementation plan. We developed a work group almost a year ago in which we called on the support of our staff internally, our community members, and said, we need to start the conversation right now and we need to have everyone involved in this discussion to really have a conversation around what are we going to do as a result of what we learn about our students and their learning. That work group is a part of the, have been a part of the conversation since last January when it was developed, have put some things in place to start this year, but now have an opportunity to be more intentional and to dig into the data that we're gonna to present today to see specifically who the individual students are, who have been impacted, figure out what's impacted their learning, and then what we're gonna do about it in our schools. I also wanna say that today we're gonna to talk about some of the follow-up of what that looks like. Now we can sit here and have the conversation about student learning and how that needs to happen in a school, but we also know that it has to be a very intentional process. Today you're gonna to hear us talk about the school improvement planning process. That's a process that we have had in place for years. We've had to revamp and look at that process and think about how can we be more intentional about what we're doing to address school improvement planning on behalf of students after this pandemic. So that will be a part of the discussion. And when we talk about school improvement planning, we're also gonna engage in what are the implications for curriculum and instruction? And how should that be focused on mathematics, literacy, assessments, professional development for teachers, all of these things that contribute to us creating the learning environment for our students. So as the team goes through this presentation today, you're also gonna have an opportunity to hear perspectives from our leaders who are directly impacting this work. And I'd like to emphasize why that's really important. At our last board meeting, we had principals come forward and really share the story about contact tracing and what that looks like in their school buildings. Today, they're gonna to come and share the process of exactly what all of the things are that they and their staff are doing together to really meet the learning needs of our students. Because while we are back in a pandemic, we do have our students back in our schools and we're glad to have them back. But we've got to focus on the educational structure and make sure that's working for them in their learning. So with that said, at this time, I am going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Keisha Addison who will begin to uh, share information with us. And I neglected to ask you to bring up the slide presentation. Um, if you could bring that up now and we can move to slide three. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, and good afternoon, members of the Board of Education. As a brief refresher, the Evidence of Learning Framework is the first prong, if you will, of the Magna Award-winning All-In Equity and Achievement Framework which is a multiple measures approach of helping us answer the questions, are our students learning and are they learning enough? The evidence of learning framework includes multiple measures, classroom measures such as course grades, district measures, which are curriculum aligned assessments, and external measures such as the measures of academic progress or the MAP assessment. These are used to help us assess student learning and inform instructional decisions. The evidence of learning framework consists of a variety of English language arts 
and mathematics measures, each assigned to one of three categories, classroom, district, or external. Some of the multiple measures are better suited to the inform and improve instruction aspect, while, others measure, while other measures provide a more comprehensive summative view of a student's success with standards aligned learning. Reporting of the performance of students at the readiness grade levels, that is grades two, five, eight, and 11, is provided to you, the Board of Education, and the public annually in September. This is our first opportunity, as Dr. McKnight stated, to share the performance of students since the onset of the pandemic in March 2020. The interruption of assessments in the spring of 2020 did not allow us to have, the, to have all of the essential information to share with you about performance. When we examine the performance of students, it is important to view through a lens of comparing to standard self and others. With this presentation of the evidence of learning framework results, we will provide a comparison to ourselves. More clearly, you will see a comparison of results from the 2020 school year, 2020-2021 school year, excuse me, to pre-pandemic results from the 2018-2019 school year. The framework is designed to gather specific literacy and mathematics measurement information in a systematic way within grade levels and certain content areas. This data is gathered in an effort to provide information on ways in which schools can better support students and the system can better support schools. In this portion of the presentation, you will see the overall percent of students in the readiness grade levels meeting evidence of learning attainment which is meeting two of three measures in literacy and mathematics. We know aggregate level district data is important. However, it can mask student performance for groups most impacted by gaps in opportunity and access. With this, you will see evidence of learning attainment data disaggregated by specific student focus groups. As the data is shared, you will see the impact of the pandemic is most heavily on our youngest learners. Now we'll turn it over to Ms. Hazel, who will share more about the measures used related to the evidence of learning framework from this past school year. All right, good evening. So I'm just going to share a little bit more about the evidence of learning framework and the components of each of the three measures. So as Dr. Addison said, we want to know what our students know and are able to do as it relates to the grade level standards and their level of proficiency. We wanted to give, in the evidence of learning framework, students as many opportunities to demonstrate their understanding. And so classroom measures, district measures, and external measures were included. So when we talk about classroom measures, we are looking at, in both literacy and mathematics, classroom grades, so what the grades that are on the report card. And for literacy, we're looking at reading grades or writing grades. In the upper grades, as we get into our secondary level, we are looking at the English course and how students did there. And for students who are English learners and are level one students, we're looking at their ESOL grades on the report card. In mathematics, again, we're looking at those, those grades on the report card. For our district assessments, those are the assessments that we either create in a central office through our curriculum office or assessments that accompany our curriculum. So curriculum comes with us an assessment suite and we gather together to take a look at what assessments we want to use for that district measure and we share with our schools what those assessments will be in the timeline that they have to administer those assessments. So that is the district assessment that all schools will engage in. And we also then have our external assessments, again, looking at um, those uh, standards-based assessments, standardized, nationally normed assessments, such as the measures for academic progress in reading or math, we call that MAP. We look at the WIDA access, which is the assessment that we give our English learners. That's also included. And then we also look at assessments such as SAT or the APIB assessment. So those are also considered for our students in uh, 11th grade. So there are a number of external measures that count. And as Dr. Addison said, we're looking for students to meet at least two of the three measures, meaning they could meet 
um, proficiency with that classroom and district, but may not meet it in external, or it could be external and district and may not meet it in classroom. But we're looking to see what percentage of our students are meeting evidence of learning with two of the three measures. And so Dr. Addison is going to go through the data with us now, and that's what we're considering. So we're not just looking at one data point, we're really thinking about the evidence of learning based on two of three measures. So I'll hand it back over to Dr. Addison. Thank you. Here we transition to the percent of students meeting evidence of learning attainment and literacy. Before detailing what is indicated on the slide, I would like to acclimate you to the layout of the slide. On the lower right-hand side of the slide is the color key. Our goal is that at least 90% of students meet evidence of learning attainment. For each of the readiness grade levels, there are two bars with the top bar representing pre-pandemic data from 2018-2019 and the bottom representing 2020-2021 data during the pandemic. At the end of the two bars, is the percentage point difference between the two time periods. To begin with grade two, at the end of the 2018-2019 school year, 82.8% of students met evidence of learning attainment compared to 47.5% of grade two students at the end of the 2020-2021 school year. This represents a 35.3 percentage point decrease. For grade five, 81.8 0.1% of grade five students met evidence of learning attainment and literacy in 2018 and 2019, compared to 57.6% this past school year, representing a 23.5 percentage point decrease. At grade eight, 80.1% 80, 80 met literacy attainment in 2018, 2019, compared to 69.3% in 2020, 2021, representing a 10, 0.8 percentage point decrease. For grade 11, there was a 9.2 percentage point decrease when comparing 2018-2019 to 2020-2021. Next slide, please. On this slide are literacy results for black or African American students. With these data, you will notice larger decreases in meeting attainment at the elementary level compared to the secondary level. For grade two, there was a 38.2 percentage point decrease in comparing the two years, and at grade five, there was a 25.9 percentage point decrease. Next slide, please. Similar results are observed for our Hispanic Latino students, larger decreases at the elementary level compared to the secondary level. For grade two, a 46.2 percentage point decrease between the two years and for grade five, a 34.4 percentage point decrease. For grades eight and 11, there were 16.7 and 14.7 percentage point decreases respectively. Next slide, please. Next are the results for our students receiving free and reduced price meal system services or farms. Results show larger decreases at the elementary level with a 45.6 percentage point decrease at grade two and a 32.3 percentage point decrease at grade five. For grade eight, a 14.8 percentage point decrease is observed and 15.2 percentage points for grade 11. Next slide, please. For black or African-American students not receiving farms, there was a decrease of 31.9 percentage points for grade two, a 22.5 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 6.8 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and an 8.5 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. For Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms, there was a decrease of 37.9 percentage points for grade two, a 26.7 percentage point decrease for grade five, an 11.8 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and a 9.2 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. As we share the results for black or African-American students receiving farms, we see a decrease of 41.3 percentage points for grade two, a 27.2 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 7.4 percentage point decrease for grade eight, 
and a 12 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. For Hispanic Latino students receiving farms, there was a decrease of 49.4 percentage points for grade two, a decrease of 36.2 percentage points for grade five, a 17.1 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and an 18 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. For students receiving English speakers of other languages or ESOL services, there was a decrease of 47.5 percentage points for grade two, a decrease of 29.9 percentage points for grade five, an 11.5 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and a 20.6 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. In the area of literacy for students with disabilities, there was a decrease of 23.5 percentage points for grade two, an 11 percentage point decrease for grade five, a slight increase for grade eight of less than one percentage point, and a slight decrease for grade 11 of less than one percentage point. Next slide, please. Now we transition to evidence of learning attainment and mathematics. Overall, across the readiness grade levels, we see decreases ranging from a high of 20.6 percentage points at grade two to a low of 2.3 percentage points at grade 11. Next slide, please. With mathematics for black or African-American students, there was a decrease of 24.5 percentage points for grade two, a 27.1 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 13.3 percentage point decrease for grade eight, for grade 11, you will notice a slight one percentage point increase. Next slide, please. For our Hispanic Latino students, decreases range from a high of 36.9 percentage points at grade five to a low of 2.6 percentage points for grade 11. Next slide, please. For our students receiving farms services, Decreases range from a high of 33.8 percentage points at grade five to a low of 3.2 percentage points at grade 11. Next slide, please. For black or African-American students not receiving farms, there was a decrease of 15.8 percentage points for grade two, a 25.9 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 15.1 percentage point decrease for grade eight, for, 11, for grade 11, a 3.7 percentage point increase was observed. <clears throat> you may wonder about the difference at grade 11. It is essential to point out that at this grade level, <clears throat> excuse me. It is essential to point out that at this grade level, there are multiple opportunities embedded in the framework. For the external measure, we include the extent to which students meet measures related to the Maryland College and career readiness. This illustrates the value of having varied and multiple measures within the categories, meaning the classroom, district, and external aspect of the evidence of learning framework. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms, a slight percentage point increase was observed at grade 11, and percentage point decreases were observed for grades two, five, and eight. Next slide, please. For black or African-American students receiving farms, there was a decrease of 29.2 percentage points for grade two, a 27.3 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 10.6 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and a one percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. For Hispanic Latino students receiving farms, there was a decrease of 34.4 percentage points for grade two, a 38.2 percentage point decrease for grade five, an 18.5 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and a 4.2 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. For students receiving ESOL services, there was a decrease of 29.9 percentage points for grade two, 
a 29.2 percentage point decrease for grade five, a 10.6 percentage point decrease for grade eight, and a 2.8 percentage point decrease for grade 11. Next slide, please. In mathematics for students with disabilities, percentage point decreases were observed for students in grades two, five, and eight. For grade 11, there was a 2.7 percentage point increase. This slide concludes the focus on the evidence of learning results. Now we'll transition to sharing college and career readiness results for the class of 2021. Next slide, please. Here we see the percent of students who met the standards aligned with the College and Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013. This is first measured at the end of grade 11 with additional opportunities offered in grade 12 if a student does not meet by the end of grade 11. Each year, we share with you and the public how the most recent graduating class performed in this area, as well as how, um, I'm sorry, overall for the class of 2020, 2021, 79.7% of students met college and career readiness expectations in both literacy and mathematics. Presented on this slide are percentages for gender, services, and racial ethnic groups. Among racial ethnic groups, the percentage of students meeting college and career readiness in both literacy and mathematics ranges from 94.1% for Asian students to 62.7% for Hispanic Latino students. For students receiving services, 49% of students identified as limited English proficient met college and career readiness in both areas. 64.2% of our students receiving farms met in both areas, and 65.5% of students receiving special education services met in both areas. Next slide, please. Again, we are reviewing the data for the class of 2021, but through the lens of our focus groups. Percentages meeting both range from 93.9% .9 for our Asian, white, and all other student groups not receiving farms to 58.3% for our Hispanic, Latino students receiving farms services. Next slide, please. In concluding the data review portion of the presentation, I will share a brief review of key takeaways from the data presented. We note decreases for students in our readiness grade levels in both literacy and mathematics comparing 2020-2021 to the 2018-2019 pre-pandemic performance. With the decreases observed, data reveal the largest decreases for our youngest learners, especially specifically grade two with regard to literacy. While there were decreases across both literacy and mathematics, the decreases were not as high for mathematics as they were for literacy for students in the readiness grade levels. With what was shared, there were a few bright spots among students in grade 11, specifically for mathematics. We saw slight increases for black or African American students not receiving farms, Hispanic Latino students not receiving farms, and students with disabilities. Last, we reviewed our college and career readiness data for the class of 2021, where 80% met the standards in both literacy and mathematics. This ends my portion of the presentation of data. The remainder of the presentation will focus on the instructional and curricular response to these data. I will now turn it over to you, Ms. Wolf, for board discussion about the evidence of learning in college and career readiness data. Okay, I'm going to start with Dr. Daka. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I need to really look at this, but it looks like elementary education is very important. Ms. Mandrowski? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I'm sure it's not a big surprise to anybody that <laughs> there have been uh, decreases in overall performance and stuff with everything that's been going on with the pandemic. Um, I, you know, hope that people understand this is not just an MCPS issue. This is a national um, issue and concern that everybody's dealing with. But um, my only question really was just in terms of, do we have any kind of data in reference to attendance um, information, like attendance records for students that did not meet the measures, these measures? So we have not examined the performance um, in comparison to attendance, but it is something we can look into. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that. And how quickly will we be 
I mean, I know that we're already starting to do everything we can in terms of recovery loss, uh, learning loss of recovery, but how frequently will we be analyzing this again now that kids are back, are back in school to kind of see what progress we're making? So our evidence of learning data comes publicly to you all um, now in September as well as a mid-year check-in. However, as we um, prepare the data, we provide that information and schools have the ongoing information in our internal data systems. They are able to monitor ongoing um, to look at that data and we can, and they create periodic um, check-ins related to that, which you'll also hear more about in terms of the second half of the presentation related to the school improvement planning process. Okay, I appreciate that. My only last thing is just about um, some of the supports, but I'm assuming that will be later in the, right? Okay, thank you. And if I can also jump in, Ms. Wondrowski, there will be other opportunities where data is shared publicly with the board. For example, on October 26th, we'll be bringing back to share map data. That's great, thank you. Ms. Sylvester. Um, no, I think that the data is very sobering and um, we have a lot of work to do this year and so I will hold all my comments because the next part of the presentation is what we're going to do about it. So thank you. Ms. Evans. No, like Ms. Um, Silvestre, I think a lot of my questions, the questions that I would ask would be the questions that you would respond to in the next portion. Um, but I'm glad that we have this information and that we can show parents in our community that we are aware and that we're working towards um, making progress and change. So thank you. Ms. Harris. Thank you. Um, I do have a question building on Ms. Mondrowski's question about attendance. When we were, sorry, the building on Ms. Mondrowski's question about attendance and have we been able to try to marry attendance data on students with the performance on these three different measures. And I, an, uh, kind of an ancillary question, do we know how many students for whom we're missing one of these data points? Because I think we know, we've all heard from many, many families that uh, of struggles that either they had in assisting their students to fully participate in instruction, especially our youngest learners, and families that we were never really able to engage well. And um, so do we have, do we know that information? We do know the number of students um, who did not meet or who didn't have it. We just didn't include it in this, so we can include that as a follow-up so you can see a more detail of the number and percent. Okay. And I think one of the things, um, just um, reflecting on some of the public comment that we heard, I think this makes it very clear that it's essential that we keep students in school um, learning and on those instances in which they can't because of quarantine that they're getting really high quality virtual instruction. And um, just along those lines, um, I'm just maybe asking for some follow up about some of the stories we're hearing about schools that are defaulting to whole class quarantine when a student test positive, families wondering if that is reflecting true contact tracing or is simply an easier step to take. And then making sure we are supporting families who um, students are at home with the learning packages, the quarantine packages that were re referenced um, in our uh, September 9 meeting. And um, also, um, I've been hearing from some families who, in the instance in which a student is either is, is um, either tests positive or is placed in quarantine because of they were a contact, how the family should handle their other children, other siblings who may or may not go to the same school, but are certainly most likely going to be considered an, a contact of their sibling who is quarantining or isolating, and making sure we're putting the bridges in place so that those students are also maintaining contact with their learning and know what to do, whether it's continue to go to school, notify the school that they're going to quarantine, that kind of thing. Um, thank you. Can I just uh, 
may I interject for here just a second, uh, Ms. Harris? So a couple of things that you, you brought out that I think we should absolutely clarify. Your question around who was engaged in the testing of that is a really critical one because uh, through the data that we're sharing today, this is um, involving assessment of students last year, okay? When they were uh, not within, may not have been in the school context, may have been at home and participating on those assessments. So in some ways, we have to always elevate that limitation in the data because it is important to consider. Um, as we mirror up who also was not engaged, it's just important to remember how they engaged when they participated in these assessments. So I just wanted to raise that because I think it is a really important part that we have to consider in this data. That's why when we come back on, I believe it's October 29th to be able to share the map data, we're gonna be really tuned into that because that will be the assessment that our students are taking right now that closes on October 8th when we know that they're in the schools and being administered those MAP uh, tests in a way that's more traditional that they've done in the past. So um, that's why that triangulation of data is really important because you're not just looking at one subset of it, but all of it. Um, on to the, 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 the quarantining piece, and I'm glad you brought that forward, Ms. Harris, because there was a lot of um, comments about that in, in public comment, and so I'll continue to say yes. We are, the, the one thing that's different this year from last year is that we're bringing our schools back in full capacity. And we continue to work with our schools um, on making sure that those quarantine plans are implemented. Earlier today, I know I, I was listening and, and it reminded me of the process that we went through when we decided exactly what these quarantine plans would look like. And it became very clear in all the feedback that we selected from our parents and our students who were involved, particularly for our students at the secondary level, their interest was to be able to have their teachers support them during quarantine. Hands down, that's what our students said that they valued most. So with that said, there are two things that we're working here. We're working a school system that's serving students who are coming for in-person learning with all of those teachers who are providing that, and then also those students who, as a result, of a, a quarantine status or just us managing the pandemic have to quarantine. And so we're trying to think about how do we continue to do that with students getting the value that they want, which is to interact with their teacher, but also acknowledging that those are the same teachers who are providing instruction for the students who are there in person. And taking into consideration what that means for the teacher. Um, we learned a lot during the spring when teachers were doing this simultaneously. And so there were pros and cons to that. Um, but I say that because it's important to have that background knowledge and the consideration, but it also means that we will continue to learn and take the feedback and adjust accordingly. So I'm glad you did circle back to that, uh, Ms. Harris, because I did want to have an opportunity to address that. And you actually um, made me remember a question I wanted to ask, and that is, look, this is so we're looking back at you know data from last year as compared to 2018-19, but I know we've already started the process of um, doing some assessments for our students this fall. And I'm wondering if we're keeping track of students who took MAP testing while they were in quarantine. Because I have heard from some students that had to, that struggled with that this year. And I'm sure it must be big picture, a small percentage of students. But if we're looking at those students particularly to see um, if it, their results testing in quarantine if they were doing that was, um, were seem representative for them. So um, I do want to respond to the piece in terms of taking the MAP assessment virtually um, versus in person. And one of the things that we explored last school year um, was looking at trend data across multiple years to see, is there any difference? Um, because we heard a lot of comments stating that the virtual assessment for MAP wasn't reliable. And we were able to refute that to basically show that when we looked across in-person assessment for MAP and virtual assessment, there was consistency in terms of performance. So that was a, a bright spot for us and a valuable lesson for us to know. And so when we think about our students and as few as they may be who might be in quarantine taking the MAP assessment, we have confidence in that the results that we'll receive for them should be consistent and um, provide a good information for us of what they know and are able to do in literacy and math. But I do want to say that the assessment window is wide enough uh, that we shouldn't have 
students uh, taking the assessment in quarantine or if it is very few. Once we get towards the end of that assessment window, we may hear about more students popping up, but we still have time to go back to school and take that assessment. Thank you. Ms. O'Looney. Yeah. So this is a lot of data. <laughs> Um, and I thank you both and everyone who worked on collecting it and synthesizing it so that it's easy to understand for our community. Um, but we have a lot of data in MCPS, and so um, I think we need to be really careful about making sure that this doesn't just impact the work here that's done at central office, but also impacting teachers and students who are actually in the classroom day to day um, trying to grow and, and move on and learn from this. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. And the other thing I wanted to say was um, related to a comment that President Wolf made at our last meeting um, when we had a panel of students um, talking about their experiences returning back to in-person school. I think in this case as well, it would be great to get some qualitative data uh, in addition to this quantitative data about what teachers experienced and saw in their students over remote learning and now that we're returning. Um, I know it's a little bit more difficult to collect and not as easy to depict in, in graphs, um, but I think it would be really, really valuable to sort of humanize what we're seeing here in these, in these pages and slides of data. Um, so that would just be one thing that I wanted to add, but thank you both. Okay, and I think I will just say that I don't think that there are any real surprises in this data. Now that we know it, the real question is, what are we going to do about it? So I'm waiting to hear the, the information you're going to present in the next part. Does anybody have any further question on this section? Dr. Daka? Um, I think the bars and the graphs were much better than we've had before. Easy to understand. The percentages were added, and you also subtracted the numbers that uh, the scores went down. But really, this, I think, is very uh, transparent. Well, thank you, Dr. Daka. And I, I do just want to publicly um, thank Dr. Jimmy Jang, who was a new supervisor in the Office of Shared Accountability, who is, has that visual data visualization background, and so he's the visionary around this. So I just want to appreciate him for his time and effort in this. Thank you. Dr. McKnight? Yes, thank you. So hopefully Dr. Jang is queuing in, because I know Dr. Addison and the team, they spent a lot of time saying this is the first time that we're showing this data, and we want it to be able to make sense to people so that it can be easy to read. So I am deeply appreciative for that. So as our team transitions to continue the discussion, um, I want to highlight something uh, Ms. Aluni, a comment Ms. Aluni just made in terms of making sure that the data that we just presented has meaning on the ground level and so that the, those who are addressing everything that we saw in the data can make meaning of it to improve uh, the conditions and learning conditions for our students. So we're going to continue the presentation by making the connections from what we have already seen and know about our students' performance to what we are going to do, as President Wolf said, and put in place to support our student learning. We're going to discuss the ongoing process that the school improvement planning process provides. I mentioned that early on in our process, but that is the process that we use centrally to help guide schools in their discussion around uh, those essential questions of, are our students learning? Are they learning enough? If not, then why not? And what are we going to do about it? Those are the essential questions that have to live into the classroom as we uh, bring everyone back in and focus on the process of teaching and learning. We're going to discuss how we're going to use ass uh, assessments of learning to inform changes in instructional practice practices and uh, what we use the assessments for, particularly in learning. And so today we've talked about a number of diagnostic assessments that we've used in the system over time. What's going to be really important now is that conversation between the teacher and the student um, for the teacher to be able to understand at that moment, is the student learning the content in this moment? What, are we, what am I doing in response to that in real time and for each individual student? We just saw a lot of data, but now we've got to put those numbers to names, names to faces, and personalize that. And this is where the power is going to come into us shifting the data that we just saw and truly being about the students and their needs and, and, and supporting our teachers in that process. 
We're gonna discuss the acceleration of learning and how that's focused on ensuring that prerequisite understanding and mastery of grade level content is in place. And finally, we're gonna talk about some of the interventions that we have in place. We've been, uh, we started this year saying we're gonna provide a high dosage of tutoring for our students to help them catch up and spend time getting reinforcement on the content that they may not have mastered over the past year. But we're also gonna to have to talk about the professional learning that's provided to the staff who's gonna be in the classroom with the students every day to understand the learners better and to even understand them and the impact of their learning post pandemic. I'm sure some of our teachers are welcoming our students back into the classrooms that they may have known before, but now there's a different student need after 18 months of having to learn differently um, and supporting them through that process. So with that said, I appreciate the team that's here. We've had a lot of discussions about how they are supporting the principals, the teachers, staff development teachers, reading specialists, all of those staff in schools to really bring what we're doing about the data that we just saw to life on behalf of the students um, and support for their learning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. James Kusos, to begin this part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. McKnight. Good evening to Ms. Wolf, Ms. Silvestri, and the members of the Board of Education. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. Uh, my name is James Kutzos. I'm an area associate superintendent in the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools. And our team is here to talk with you this evening about mitigating the learning disruptions. And as you can see from this slide, there are six areas of focus. Um, our team in area two is going to dig a bit deeper into the school improvement planning process and share information with you about that area of focus. And then my colleague, Ms. Hazel, uh, the Associate for Curriculum and Instructional Programs, is going to delve more deeply with her team into the other five areas of focus. And they include literacy and mathematics, instructional focus, assessment of and for learning, acceleration of learning, tutoring and intervention support, as well as the final area of focus, professional learning. So if we could move to the next slide, please. As previously mentioned, school improvement planning is the first and among the most essential areas of focus as we work collaboratively across the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools to support our schools and our unified goal to mitigate the learning disruptions, to ensure all students are on grade level or higher for literacy and math by the end of this school year. Our school improvement plans are intended to be specific, strategic, excuse me, and data-driven. The evidence of learning data we just reviewed together indicates the importance of our purposeful approach to this work. Once the school improvement plan is developed and established, it is incumbent upon the school leadership team and key staff, parent, and student stakeholders to document and monitor the action steps, as well as the multiple data measures identified within the plan to accelerate and sustain the learning growth of all of our students. In the past, the Office of School Support and Improvement provided the primary guidance and support to schools as they navigated the school improvement process. Under Dr. McKnight's vision and leadership, along with our chief, Ms. Rochelle Rubin, one OTLS is fully engaged across all four offices, SSI, Curriculum and Instructional Programs, Special Education, and Student Family Support and Engagement. Through effective communication, collaboration, and coordination, we are united and accountable to our schools in delivering strategic and comprehensive support within the school improvement plan process. Can we move to the next slide, please? The school improvement plan has three primary components. Our academic focus on effective instruction in literacy and math brings together a robust review of multiple data measures, including the ones presented earlier today, to inform and drive decisions made within each school that will impact student learning experiences. This data analysis combined with evidence-based resources in curriculum and pedagogy, supports the delivery of macro 
and micro professional learning for school leadership teams. Central to this work is our MCPS core value of equity. All of us within one OTLS and across MCPS are responsible and accountable to our schools and our students to promote and support the effective implementation of equitable and anti-racist instructional strategies every day in every classroom. Finally, the well-being of our entire school community, staff, students, and families must be attended to and intentionally provisioned for within the SIP, the School Improvement Plan. If we create and foster an environment where we feel safe, respected, and valued, we will accelerate and sustain learning in literacy and math. At this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Christoph Turk, Director of Learning, Achievement, and Administration, to share more specifics on how we support and monitor the school improvement planning process within one OTLS. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and esteemed board members. My name is Christoph Turk, and I'm the director of the Clarksburg, Sherwood, and Watkins Mill clusters. It is an honor to be here tonight. Throughout this slide, I will present the role that the School Improvement Plan, which is often referred to as the SIP, plays in our response to the student achievement data shared today. And while this data is difficult to see and concerning to hear, I assure you that our principals and leadership teams have been working around the clock since the summer when they first engaged their instructional leadership teams in a rigorous analysis of their school's end-of-year performance data at the local level to prepare a comprehensive plan driven by exceptional core instruction, targeted academic support, meaningful professional learning, and results-oriented leadership. Our principals have transcended every challenge and risen to every occasion since March 2020 with unwavering dedication, instructional ingenuity, and student-first leadership. And they, their school communities, and all departments in central office are taking the same spirit of resilience to this data we have taken to every historic consequence of this tragic pandemic. We are currently engaged in a process of collaboration and support among each director, principal, and leadership team to drive the robust development and implementation of the school improvement plan. The support from each director begins with engaging each school principal and their leadership team around three interconnected buckets that are salient variables underpinning the SIP. The first involves the SIP action plan and guiding questions designed to ensure the SIP is a comprehensive and fully inclusive plan that centers on the unique and important context of each school community. Within the action plan, we have a precise and intentional approach to developing meaningful action steps to drive school improvement across every cluster in MCPS. This strategy includes the use of guiding questions that reflect our district-wide commitment to weaving the focus of equity and learning on anti-racism into the fabric of every school's work. As directors, we support principals and their leadership teams to engage with the guiding questions to complete each category of the SIP, which includes a section on equity, literacy and math, and social emotional well-being and school climate. Secondly, our consistent collaboration around the use of guiding questions plays an essential role in helping our principals leverage a range of data measures to inform a meaningful root cause analysis, or RCA, as they develop the SIP action plan. Thirdly, each director is intentional in their support of principals around a cornerstone commitment of stakeholder voice and commitment rooted in our SIP process. We not only collaborate with principals to establish a strong and meaningful process for including staff, student, family, and community voice within the SIP, but also supervise the implementation of each school's strategic approach to get there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> On this slide, you will see one of the sections of the SIP that includes our guiding questions related to literacy and math. It is important to note that our guiding questions within the SIP are designed to help schools reflect on stakeholder inclusion. For example, when reflecting on school climate for students and families, one of our questions asks, how will you collect parent voices to understand and support student well-being 
and a welcoming environment for families through a racially proficient lens. This is why our engagement and collaboration with principals as thought par partners throughout the SIP is a critical lever of success. This work is already happening across our schools. During the summer, school, summer schools met and examined the same data you have seen here at the individual site-based level. Their leadership teams used that data to engage the early SIP planning stages, centering their collaboration on the improvement of achievement results. As an example, Nikisha Blackman, principal of Captain James Daly Elementary School and her leadership team responded to their early ELA and math performance data in grades kindergarten through second grade by reimagining their team, teacher team approach to data-driven instruction at weekly collaborative team planning. Principal Blackman and her team identified a need for enhanced classroom instruction tailored to different student areas of performance. As a result, her team developed new and innovative protocols to generate data center dialogue among teachers, followed by structured team time to apply their expert analysis to evolving and strengthening lesson plans that drive the subsequent instructional delivery. Another example is Kim Bosnick, principal of William Gibbs Junior Elementary School, and her leadership team's work to address the decline they experienced in student literacy achievement. As a result, her team honed in on the PRESS model, which stands for Pushing In Reading Exceptional Support Services, to double down on an evidence-based best practice previously used to yield significant improvement in student reading outcomes. This model is a school-wide collaborative literacy framework that utilizes reading specialists, teacher assistants, and staff to support the classroom teacher every day with small group literacy instruction. Essentially, Principal Bosnick is maximizing every staff member in her building to have a direct and positive impact on the quality and scale of targeted instruction, leveraging both intervention and accelerated teaching in response to each child's individual literacy needs. Her team is analyzing in-person assessment data being collected this month, and they are targeting October as the launch date for press. Each of these schools make up just a small sample size of the strategic and resourceful leadership happening across MCPS in response to the decline in student achievement data. Throughout this time, as SIPs are being established, each director provides coaching support to principals to help address learning barriers that surface throughout the school year and respond with macro learning opportunities for the leadership team. We do this in a variety of ways, which can include engaging in data analysis with school teams, visiting classrooms to observe instructional practice with principals and school leaders, immersing in staff professional learning, collaborating with school instructional leadership teams, and frequent check-ins designed to engineer meaningful dialogue with principals about what is working well and what we must improve. Ultimately, we are most impactful to our principals when we are consistently present and visible in their work in order to effectively and continuously coach, support, and supervise their instructional leadership through a shared commitment of excellence and trust. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. I am now going to turn this over to one of our A2A learning and achievement specialists, Jennifer Loznak. Thank you, Dr. McKnight and members of the board for this opportunity to share how learning and achievement specialists are directly supporting the needs of schools to address the data you saw today. My name is Jennifer Loznak, and I'm a learning and achievement specialist in school support and improvement for the Clarksburg, Sherwood, and Watkins Mill clusters. As we return to in-person instruction from the pandemic, we are working with school instructional leadership teams, which includes administrators, staff development teachers, teacher leaders, and supporting services to address the impact on learning and well-being. I'd like to take a moment to paint a picture of what this looks like in my role as a learning and achievement specialist. During the summer, I supported an elementary school to analyze the current and historical data from the evidence of learning framework. Much like the system data Dr. Addison just presented, the school noticed a need to elevate and accelerate the learning for black or African-American farm students and Hispanic Latino farm students. 
the school also decided to first focus on math. To prepare for this year's incoming students, teachers engaged in required district-wide summer math training to address the needs generated by the pandemic. There was a strong emphasis on knowing the math and knowing their students as key components to improvement. In a recent coaching session, the school decided to start the year by collecting data from instruction, collaborative planning, student experiences, and the most current assessments. With students back for in-person instruction, they wanted to establish an accurate baseline to measure incremental growth throughout the year, as well as reflect along the way on the intentional and strategic instructional decisions that promoted the growth. Once these data are synthesized later this month, I will collaborate, coach, and support the instructional leadership team to outline their next steps. Next steps for the school could be, but are not limited to, building the capacity of leaders to guide collaborative planning sessions where math teachers are studying the Eureka math curriculum. And studying the curriculum, teachers are understanding the big picture of the unit, working through the concept development, doing the student problem sets, and completing the exit ticket in order to hone the lesson for students who may need enrichment or accelerated learning. They could be developing protocols to analyze and compare data from assessments for learning that will inform teachers about the student's depth of knowledge and progress towards being on grade level or above. They may be facilitating professional learning opportunities for instructional leaders to provide coaching and feedback to teachers. When teachers are given the support to refine and enhance their own teaching, teachers will, t will be willing to take instructional risk to reach the students who have yet to experience success. These possible next steps will occur in conjunction with the essential focus on students' well-being, meaning that the racial, social, and linguistic differences of students will be valued. In, up, in an upcoming coaching session, we will explore and align the resources of restorative justice and leader in me to ensure students' well-being is a priority and embedded within the daily learning experience. In each coaching session with the school, I am striving to ensure district-wide initiatives and goals are being actualized so that students can prosper. That's just a single story of one school and one learning and achievement specialist. There are 209 schools and 27 learning and achievement specialists. There are 500, there are 5,643 differentiated stories of strategic support to schools that will address the math and literacy data shared today. Here are a few examples of what other learning and ach achievement specialists are doing. They are collaborating with schools to ensure students with disabilities are transitioning back to in-person learning with appropriate accommodations to be successful. They are providing schools with learning on how to scaffold instruction for English language learners so that they can have access to rigorous instruction and achieve at high levels. They are supporting resource teachers and content specialists to lead department meetings focused on analyzing data and interrogating the teaching pedagogies that have unintended impacts on our most marginalized students. They are coaching staff development teachers to deliver macro professional learning and additional building leaders to continue micro learning that engages adult learners. They are being thought partners to leaders as they creatively work to address the needs of their students. And they are also collaborating within and across the office for evidence-based strategies that support schools to have equitable outcomes for students. Our actions and commitment to our schools and students will address this math and literacy data. On a large scale, learning and achievement specialists are working through the lens of the school improvement plan to support schools in consistently analyzing multiple data sources to measure progress of the system goal, ensuring all students are on grade level or higher by the end of the school year, as well as reflecting on actions within the school and adapting their school improvement plan as needed. We understand this is no small task, but every learning and achievement specialist is committed to disrupting the trends you saw here today in the data, where farm students for both black or African American students and Hispanic Latino students are consistently not achieving at the same level as their peers, according to the evidence of learning framework. We are ready to meet the challenges of today's public education and address the disparities because we sincerely care about all of our students. Every day, we are working towards a school system where achievement is not predictable by race or socioeconomic status, but where educational equity is achieved. Now, more than ever before, we are communicating within the offices of teaching, learning, and schools 
to collaborate and coordinate our support to schools. With that, I pass the microphone from School, Import, School Support and Improvement to Nikki Hazel, Associate Superintendent for Curriculum and Instructional Programs. Thank you very much, Ms. Lesnack. First, I want to start off by saying that we agree the data is alarming. And there is no doubt our students experience significant disruptions to their learning. But based on the national trends, as you've mentioned, we've been reading and monitoring. We have been preparing, as Dr. McKnight said, for addressing the learning disruptions for several months. And so Mr. Kutso started by sharing with you the six components of our response to the data. They started with the school improvement planning process, and I'm going to continue with the remaining areas uh, from the perspective of curriculum and instruction. If you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, there you are. All right. Uh, so the first, uh, the next area is uh, focused on literacy instructional focus, and then I'll move to the mathematics instructional focus. You can see, just as a reminder, the data on the left-hand side is an overall look at how our students performed while in the pandemic. And you can see there is a significant decline with our grade two students uh, at that primary level. We do attribute the decrease to the challenges of teaching foundational literacy skills in a virtual environment. When I talk about foundational literacy skills, I'm talking about phonics, phonemic awareness, decoding, word recognition. Those types of skills that we would normally teach our primary level students become very challenging to do virtually. Therefore, the literacy focus at the elementary level includes increasing the number of minutes that we will be teaching foundational reading skills in grades K to three. Normally, we might focus on K to two, but you notice that these students are now in third grade. So we really need to hone in to make sure those students uh, we are responding to. We are providing letters training, which stands for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling to our teacher leaders. And that will again help our teacher leaders support our classroom teachers with implementation of those foundational skills. We have a structured literacy pilot taking place with about 10 of our elementary schools in partnership with our external dyslexia work group. We are increasing the use of decodable texts. And we also really want to hone in on the small group instruction with targeted differentiated strategies. Again, our goal is for our students to be on or above grade level by the end of the school year. That third grade group of students is really critical. Teachers will be administering for informal running records on a regular basis as they are working with their small groups that will help to monitor how the students are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. At the secondary level, the literacy focus will include a reduction in the number of common tasks to allow for greater depth of instruction while maintaining the standards that are necessary within the curriculum. They will include frequent evidence-based discussions and writing about complex texts. They will also increase their structures for small group discussion and elevate critical thinking. We also want to note the data around our English learners and recognize that there was a significant decline. And so we have been working very hard to mitigate that learning disruption. We've been working with our classroom and ESOL teachers to ensure that the content in mathematics and literacy and the English language development are aligned. We've been working with our teachers on co-planning and co-teaching so that those uh, students have a seamless transition between what they are receiving from their ESOL teacher and their content teacher. We also have trained this summer our staff on the, both the academic and the social emotional aspects of receiving students with limited or interrupted formal education. We call that SLIFE, and in the upper grades, our METS students. We also want to just say thank you to the County Council for providing us with some coaches that will support the students who are coming into their home schools with that limited and uh, interrupted formal education. 
We also uh, want to recognize that uh, actually Mr. Kutsos and uh, his team and my team have been working closely in an initiative called Support Ed, where we have a consultant who was going into schools and working to provide professional development, do observations, provide coaching, and we have learned a tremendous amount from that experience. Next slide, please. We'll focus on the mathematics instructional focus. And you see there a decline in the data as well, not as significant as the literacy. But we do attribute that decline, particularly in fifth grade and eighth grade, to the implementation of a new, more rigorous curriculum. Uh, we noticed that, that students who are in the upper grades um, transitioning out of one curriculum into another had a more challenging time with that transition than the younger students. So as you recall, last school year around this time, we received a significant amount of feedback from schools and community about the pace of the instruction in the virtual environment, particularly mathematics. And as a result, we did make adjustments to the mathematics pacing. Therefore, this school year, the math focus for both elementary and secondary will be to address the unfinished learning from last school year and focus on a deeper understanding of the mathematics. At the elementary level, foundational days have been built into instruction. And both levels, uh, the curriculum office has developed guidance documents that directly address foundational standards that were adjusted. Extension models, modules were also created at the secondary level. I do want to note that both for literacy and mathematics, the implementation of new curriculum has actually occurred more in the pandemic and more in a virtual environment than in a school building. So we are really focusing our efforts on supporting schools with fidelity of implementation of that curriculum as we move forward. We spent a great deal of time this summer supporting our schools with English language development and also our students who receive special education services. We also spent time focusing on students who need enrichment. And we don't want to forget those students who were actually on grade level and needing to be enriched. Next slide, please. The third response to the data is to really focus on assessment of and for learning. And I, I think we heard uh, some comments about how we are using the evidence of learning data to support the work that is happening in the schools. In order to mitigate the learning disruptions, it is very critical that our schools use assessment data to drive the instructional decisions. So assessment of learning measures how much students have learned in meeting grade level expectations. It guides the school improvement planning process the programs and the supports that we provide our students. Dr. Addison and I co-lead the Evidence of Learning Workgroup, which is a cross-office and cross-school-based group designed to examine the assessment of learning in the district. And our charge is to ensure that schools are using these data to drive their school improvement planning processes. Assessment for learning embeds assessment processes throughout the teaching and learning, and this allows teachers to constantly adjust their daily instructional goals. Teachers are encouraged to use informal assessment tools such as exit tickets, conferencing, peer and self-evaluations to inform what students know and where they should begin the next day. Next slide, please. I wanted to just share with you an example of assessment for learning, and this is what we want to see happening in our classrooms on a regular basis. On the left-hand side, you will see what our middle schools call in their new LearnZillion curriculum a cool down. And on the right-hand side, you will see what our elementaries call an exit ticket from the Eureka Math curriculum. And the middle school question shows three correct responses. And it asks the student to select one of those responses and explain why the thinking is correct. The elementary question asks the students to fix the work that is incorrect by making a new drawing using the number sentence that's provided. 
So both of these examples of learning checks ask students to explain their thinking. It's more than just a multiple choice, pick an answer. It allows the teacher an opportunity to conference with students, get a better understanding of their thinking, give feedback to students. It also allows teachers to review written responses to inform what students know and where they should begin the following day. When this is done consistently, the learning checks are a good predictor of how our students are going to do on those district assessments. Those are the assessments aligned to the curriculum, a part of evidence of learning. And we feel very confident that when our teachers have focused daily objectives that include a check for understanding on a regular basis, students will demonstrate progress towards those grade level standards. Next slide, please. The fourth component of the instructional response is acceleration of learning. The um, last time we met with, at the Board of Ed meeting, I shared that remediation is not recommended as, a, as an approach to addressing these data. Research states that acceleration of student learning is recommended, and what we mean by that is moving forward with grade level content and only addressing prerequisite skills and concepts from the previous grade when it's needed. And so teachers are going to use both the assessment data and their guidance documents from the curriculum office to assist in making those instructional decisions. The Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools will continue to support our school leaders, our teachers, and uh, with content study. They will support with planning instructional delivery, data analysis, and an effort to move our students toward grade level or above standards. I do want to stop to just mention that this is not a one-size-fits-all approach. We have students who are already on or above grade level. They did well even through the pandemic, and we want to acknowledge those students that we will continue as we look at data to move them forward as well. Next slide, please. Our fifth response category is tutoring and intervention. And while we must teach all of our students at the grade level standard or above as our first instructional approach, we recognize there are students who require more intensive support. And the support we're offering at each school is high dosage tutoring or evidence-based interventions. Research does show that Learning gain can be improved with intensive tutoring. Three times a week, preferably, for students to get tutoring with the MCPS curriculum, the literacy or mathematics curriculum. And we will offer tutoring to students before, during, or after school. We want to use our MCPS staff, our teachers, and our paraeducators to support those tutoring opportunities. We will use external partners who are interested in supporting our tutoring efforts if schools are unable to find staff in their own buildings. For those students who need more significant um, support, uh, we have evidence-based interventions, and they may be more appropriate for our students. Uh, again, interventions may be implemented before, during, or after school. And we have a set of approved evidence-based interventions. Some examples are the Orton-Gillingham method, really great reading, Math 180. But we have a list of evidence-based interventions that the curriculum office and the special education office collaborated on to study and ensure they were of high quality. And we also have provided our schools with guidance documents that explain who should receive tutoring or interventions based on data. We also want to ensure that as schools are implementing tutoring or interventions that there is progress monitoring that's taking place. Many of our interventions have pre and post assessments and we have an online platform where schools can go to enter data so that we can see how students are doing at the district level and schools can see how they are doing locally. Next slide. The final area that we want to address is professional learning. 
So the Office of Teaching, Learning, and Schools has collaborated with our Assistant Chief of Learning, Professional Learning to design professional learning focused on the use of informal assessment to inform instruction in the classroom. And with this district-wide focus, training will be offered to principals, teacher leaders, and central office staff with the goal of supporting teachers as they collaboratively analyze student data and plan their next instructional moves. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Sheila Berlinger, who is the elementary mathematics supervisor, she's on Zoom, who will share how her, teacher, her team has supported teachers this summer and in the school year. Ms. Berlinger? Members of the Board of Education, it is my pleasure to be here this evening. My name is Sheila Berlinger, and I am the supervisor for elementary mathematics. It is essential that all efforts focus on acceleration, not remediation, and be student-centered and teacher-focused. Let's start from the center circle and work our way outwards. Teachers are working hard at the intersection of rolling out a new curriculum and meeting all the needs of students who have experienced unfinished learning as a result of the current pandemic. They were in need of tools and resources to navigate the challenges. Summer learning focused on how to effectively prepare to teach using Eureka Math, the importance of deeply studying the mathematics and the critical nature of understanding what students know and to what degree. School-based leaders reviewed the same content and tools while being asked to consider their roles. Principals, assistant principals, staff development teachers, and math leaders came together for a full day of live virtual instruction. They prioritized areas of need in their individual buildings, considered how they are deploying resources such as staffing, and reflected on how to monitor for effective implementation. By the end of the day, they'd identified two to four priorities along with measures that would demonstrate progress. Central office leaders who support elementary schools focused on how they could support and monitor for both effective curriculum implementation and pandemic support and recovery. The three-hour live virtual experience included the following, Eureka Math and its components and tools, the training and support MCPS committed to on behalf of all teachers and leaders, tools and strategies for returning to a more robust in-person learning environment, and a comprehensive overview of the teacher and school-based leader training through the lens of a central office role. I'm excited for you to hear how some of these tools and strategies are playing out in our schools. Next slide, please. My name is Ty Vanderbilt, and I'm currently one math leader from Greencastle Elementary. I serve on the team as a math interventionist and instruction coach. Just last year, I was teaching third grade, implementing Eureka Math for the first time with my team and the rest of my school. Pandemic recovery training this summer for both teachers and leaders reinforced the essential nature of deeply knowing both the math and our students. What does this mean for the work we're doing on behalf of student learning and achievement? Two essential conversations now occur more consistently in grade level curriculum study. Teachers deeply discuss the approaches to each part of the daily math lessons to determine the best approach for the students in front of them. Where should more time be given to an extra example? What type of question in the debrief will elicit the most information from my students? Within the same grade level, students are making, I'm sorry, teachers are making decisions that match their classrooms. Teachers are also matching appropriate problems in the daily problem set to different groups of students. This establishes flexible grouping daily, ensures students receive on grade level experiences and provides opportunity for clarifying misconception and misconceptions and encouraging more complex thinking and reasoning. Tools that were shared at training this summer, such as the modified pacing guides and the embedded professional development videos and the online teacher guides are used regularly as part of these deep, deeper discussions. 
throughout the school year, school-based math leaders will continue to come together monthly to continue to reflect on how these and other practices will enable learning to be accelerated, not remediated, and remain student-focused. Thank you, ladies. So at this time, we are going to turn it over to Ms. Wolf for questions and discussion. Thank you. I'm going to start with Ms. O'Looney. Thank you. Um, I think I just wanted to emphasize what I said before about um, the biggest difficulty of this process is definitely going to be making sure that our message and our work at central office is reaching the classroom level. So I really appreciated, um, especially this graphic we have on slide 43 about um, supporting professional learning. I think that's really valuable. I did have one question about um, the tutoring services that were mentioned. How, where can students find information about those? So we're gonna start with identifying students through the data. And so uh, schools will be contacting, some schools are ready to get started now, some schools are still in the process of just identifying their teachers, uh, and we're giving them some time to be able to do that. Our goal is to implement on around o October 11th, um, but we know that there are some schools ready to start now, some will need a little bit more time. We are going to ask schools that they contact families based on data, and then we will use our external partners if we have uh, families who are not selected, they can use those external partners for tutoring services, similar to the Tutor Me concept, but we are in the process of identifying who that external partner is going to be. So students should ex uh, expect the schools to reach out to them for those services? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Harris. Um, thank you very much for all of this. Um, first question I have builds on Ms. O'Looney's question about the um, tutoring and in intervention planning that we're doing. Um, you mentioned that uh, the high volume interventions tutoring could be before school, after school, or during school. When we're talking about uh, any of those options, are we, if a student is going to receive these services during school, how, what will that look like in the course of their school day to make sure they're not missing out on classroom instruction while they're in their um, high-focus tutoring program? So that's a really great question, and that's something that we emphasize, that this does not replace instruction. Uh, it is in addition to. And so we do have many schools that have different periods throughout the day where they could uh, have some tu tutoring taking place. For example, in my child's middle school, they have what they call charge up. And it is a time where students can get additional support. I know that they, they're called other things in other schools. So there are, for some schools, creative ways and spaces that they could do that during the school day. If that is something that they can't have happen, then they do have the option of before and after school, and we would provide teachers with stipends to do that. And if I could just add one piece to that, Ms. Harris, what Ms. Hazel is describing is those times that have been carved out or identified by schools during the school day is an example of the work in school improvement planning that's occurred over time. Schools have looked at the data that they've had on their students, identified a need, and adjusted their master schedules to create this time during the school day rather than relying on after school time where we have to um, basically hope that students will come or hope that students have available transportation. This is a scenario where we're intentional and say we're not going to rely on that. We're going to take advantage of the time that we have with students and create these periods. Yeah, thank you. Um, and a follow-up question is, um, is there a chance that a student, say a middle school, seventh grader, identified as needing the intervention tutoring would be in a position where they'd have to, for instance, give up an elective to participate? You're saying 60 to 90 minute increments, would they? No, that is ideal. It may not be something that can happen. That's an ideal state as we look at the research. We don't want students to give up electives, and we certainly don't want any of our tutoring or intervention services to impact 
that first instruction. So as, as uh, Mr. Kutso said, being very creative about how that's going to take place. Got it, thank you. And could you give some examples of how stakeholder voice, students, families was included in the uh, school improvement planning process? And was that an expectation for all of our 209 schools? So in terms of student voice, typically it's our secondary schools that will engage students through various leadership groups. It could be student government, it could be minority scholars, it could be an invitation that a school is intentional around sending to a, a random group of students because they wanna ensure they have representation across their student population. In terms of parent voice, obviously we're accessing those parent leadership groups like our uh, PTSA groups, but also another example of schools knowing that they need to access parents that are representative of their entire population. Welcoming those folks into the summertime engagement around the data, welcoming those folks into the conversations around what are the strategies that we could utilize to enhance instruction in our schools. And it's also a very important for that to be not a one-time um, convening of those parent and student stakeholders. And Mr. Turk alluded to this earlier. One of the roles of the directors of um, learning achievement and administration is to hold schools and principals and leadership teams accountable for continuing to invite those stakeholders back on at least a quarterly basis, but oftentimes it's a monthly basis through the after school or before school instructional leadership team meetings where they're continuing those checkpoints, going back and looking at data again. Have we made progress at this grade level? Have we made progress in this content? So it's really essential that schools revisit that continuously throughout the school year and that they welcome their staff, student and parent stakeholders into that. At the elementary level, parents and staff are always involved. We are always looking to explore ways to engage students at the elementary level, but there are times when it may not be as age appropriate. Thank you. So if people learning, listening to us now who are engaged in their school community and feel like they did not know about this opportunity to be involved over the summer, should they contact their director? Should they contact their school leadership? How should that happen? I think the first point of contact is always the school leadership. Okay. The relationships exist there. They exist sometimes for parents with a counselor. They exist sometimes uh, between a parent and a teacher that the child has had previously or with the principal. So we would encourage folks to reach out to the school first, but always we are a resource in OTLS and stand ready to support parents when they want to engage in that way. And so directors, learning achievement specialists, and area associates are poised and ready to assist them with that. Thank you. And the last thing um, I just wanted to discuss a bit is um, the conversation, a lot of work's gone in around the mitigation of learning disruption. But I really want to encourage us to look at the fact that mitigating learning disruption has to go hand in hand with what we're doing to mitigate COVID disruption. Because anytime a student's out of school for any reason, that is a time when they are not having their learning maximized, their, their, their learning is being disrupted. And so looking, and this goes directly to our operations around, um, and it was mentioned in some of the public comment, the lack of social distancing in schools, which every time, I think we're doing pretty well with our COVID numbers, but every time a student is placed in quarantine, that means our operational strategies in a school have put them at risk of developing COVID. So if, if that, you know, everything that we can do to enhance our use of social distancing to mitigate the health risks to students Minim helps to mitigate the learning risk to students. So um, we're hearing from a lot of parents saying, well, I don't see any social distancing. We're all seeing those crowded photos. Um, I know there are challenges because we're, we've brought students back to full capacity, but the ex to any extent we can do social distancing in the school, get kids outside for lunch, outside for learning opportunities. That means we're keeping them safer, redu we're reducing their risk, and we're also reducing their chance that they're gonna end up in quarantine at home 
which is not an optimal learning environment for them. So I just want us to really make sure that we are looking at COVID safety and learning mitigation and disruption mitigation. Those are really the same thing. Um, and that's it for me. I'm gonna go now to Dr. Daka. No, no questions. Ms. Mandrowski. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I'll be quick in the time of interest of time, but um, you had mentioned a several um, learning uh, tutoring programs that just enhance learning enhancements. Um, but then I thought you also mentioned that there was a list somewhere. So this is just a sampling, and I'm I'm only asking because I know. Like I just recently um, learned about the literacy labs and um, Matchbox and, and things like that. So I, I know that there are a multitude of programs that, that people like and, and we see a return on investment from. Are, are schools allowed to use those programs if they want to? So, we, so schools have a list of, of approved interventions. Um, you're referring to literacy lab. We have a partnership with uh, them and we work with them to select specific schools. Um, so if schools are interested or if a principal is interested, they could come to work with one of our offices to see if they could participate. Okay. But um, we have an agreement with, with them to use them in certain schools at this time. Okay. I was just kind of curious how we chose specific programs over others if there's proven um, returns on our investments. Well, we do, and we do connect with um, Maryland State Department of Education around some of the approved interventions so that we align our list with the uh, list that they have as well. Okay. I just, I want to say that I was very happy to hear about the, you know, the importance of having this data as sobering as it is and um, is the intentionality that comes with what we do with the information. and. Um, I really appreciated with what Dr. McKnight mentioned about the putting, taking this data and putting it to a face and, and taking that face and putting it to what needs to be done to make improvements and, and support our students to the best of our ability. I think we've learned a lot during COVID that we can be using and even in, you know, in hearing from our public comments and things like that and emails all the time. Um, you know, we need. It feels like we need to do better for our students in quarantine, but and along those lines, in terms of what Ms. Harris was mentioning about learning disruption, you know, we have students who are um, home for other reasons, whether it's um, long-term sickness or off and on sickness, or let's just say you've got the flu and you need to stay home. Um, are we allowing students to be able to access the quarantine? Um, protocols if they're home, whether it's even if it's not for quarantine, and if not, why not? And in lessons learned over COVID, if teachers would like to do the simultaneous teaching, are they able to, if that's something that they choose to do since we're not doing live streaming? So in terms of the question related to student attendance, if they're not in quarantine, you know, we're still implementing the practices that we've implemented around attendance. If a student has a legitimate excused absence, we are obviously providing that student and the family with additional time to complete assignments. If it is appropriate, we're looking for ways to ensure that students can check in with their teachers during the school day to unscramble any confusion that they may have around uh, assignments that are housed within Canvas or that are shared directly with the class and with the students. Um, so that's our focus in terms of other types of absences that are excused for the purposes of ensuring that learning continues with those students. And it's really important for us to note that our well-being teams in all of our schools are reaching out to those students if they're absent for more than one day to find out what are the needs of that particular student, how can, how can the well-being team first and foremost support getting that student back into the learning environment and making sure that the information, the instructional needs are met uh, through the use of that team. Okay, I appreciate that. I just want to make sure that, like I said, the keeping kids engaged, keeping them in school, obviously being the top priority, but making sure that if they're out for whatever reason, 
we are fully taking advantage and not saying, putting barriers up that don't need to be there by saying, well, you're not in quarantine, so technically that doesn't count and you can't access these. And services. our teams are constantly talking with parents because some parents have expressed some concerns around the safety plans. And what we try to do is encourage parents to come to their schools, to talk with their principals, to meet with their teams, to find out specifically what are those strategies that are in place to ensure that students are safe. And in many of those cases, I was involved in one this week where the parents met directly with the principal, that student is back in school and that student is learning and that student is available for all of what we're bringing forward in terms of in-person learning. And so our office will continue to support schools when they need to engage with parents directly to get children into school. And Ms. Mondrowski, if I may also offer, um, if you recall when we presented on the quarantine plans at uh, I think at our, one of our first board meetings, we also said that it wasn't a static plan, but that we would continue to receive the feedback and enhance. And we actually will have an update for the elementary quarantine planning, as well as taking a look at, is there a need for the fall design team? As I mentioned, they continue to do this work. And if there's a need for us to revisit um, at that secondary level, we will. But right now we are in the process of talking to our schools, the directors going out, making visits, examining those quarantine plans, making sure they're in place and accessible. So that's where we find ourselves currently. So there's a possibility that if a teacher did want to do a simultaneous teaching because they had a bunch of kids out, they could come fall. Or it's already fall, isn't it, technically, I guess, kind of. But after your review program, is that what you're saying? For, we're in collaboration with the associations. We're in collaboration with a variety of stakeholders to receive that information. Mm -hmm. And what we bring forward may look different based on all of that input. I just know that there's a lot of parents who have concerns about the students needing to teach themselves and what the data shows from last year about how, that, how well that works for, you know, doesn't work for everybody. So thank you. Ms. Silvestri. Um, Thank you. Um, trying to think if I have a question, I'm just trying to process all of this information. Um, if I recall in the late spring, uh, Dr. McKnight outlined the recovery plan as including our summer school work, our professional development, which you've described extensively today, and then the tutoring and interventions. And um, um, I'm hearing we're gonna teach to grade level and fill in the gaps with the interventions and the tutoring. We need the kids to be in school every single day and the parents to understand the supports that they're getting so that they also take full advantage of these supports. Um, I want to re-emphasize what's been said by my colleagues again, the importance of minimizing quarantine. So Dr. McKnight, uh, if you know you, this, uh, test to stay approach that Massachusetts is doing as our entire state, if we can talk to our state officials uh, so that we can uh, explore that further and see if that can be implemented statewide uh, in collaboration with our local partners, uh, just being more aggressive about the quarantine uh, policy. And um, I, I think we have to try everything we can in the playbook so that we can um, make sure that the kids are in school as much as possible. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that comment, Ms. Silvestri. Um, I want to say that the premise of everything that we've discussed today just emphasizes the importance of in-person learning for our students. The data says it. We knew it. This validates what we thought the entire time. Nothing replaces in-person learning. With that said, we plan to bring back our students and they're here in full capacity. We are still in a pandemic. Um, we will continue to look at every single measure that we can put in place in collaboration with all of our state and local health agencies around how do we do that in the safest way. Will there be students who will still have to quarantine? Absolutely, as long as we are in this pandemic. I wish that were not the case. It is. But with that said, there are a number of things that we can continue to do. Continue to look at how we are utilizing testing. I will champion and say I'm most excited about the fact that we have our rapid tests in our schools. 
because that's the first step in the right direction to make sure that we're testing students so that they can stay in school. And we can look at what's happening across the nation in other states. Um, we hear a lot of information about advocating for the uh, test to stay program, but I want to reemphasize that was a testing program that was put out by the State Department of uh, Education in the state of Massachusetts. We are in a testing program in the state of Maryland. If we deem that we want to look at other processes, that will require advocacy at the state level. It is important for us to always be in alignment with our health experts who guide us through this pandemic and put protocols in place that we adhere to as the educational experts. And so uh, absolutely, we can uh, still advocate and I encourage everyone who has an interest in that to direct that advocacy towards the state level because that's exactly what it is in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we are in the testing program here in Maryland. So uh, I just emphasize that everything that we're talking about today is focused on that in-person learning. We're gonna do everything we can to continue to look at the quarantine guidance, making sure that that quarantine plan for those students who do have to quarantine is a meaningful opportunity for their learning to continue. So. Thank uh, you, Dr. McKnight. Sure. And um, because the tutoring and interventions are so critical, I, I just had a question about um, how specific is the tutoring and or intervention to what I need as a student based on the data? Could you expand a little bit about that? Is it, you know, we're just going to cover math facts or is it more specific to what I'm missing? Um, so the tutoring will focus on the curriculum or the instruction that they are learning in the classroom at the time. Uh, so we're using our literacy and our mathematics uh, new curriculum and based on the data and we will train all of our tutors to um, basically understand where students are, understand where they are in the classroom in terms of what they are learning and again, that's another way that we elevate that acceleration of learning so that we can uh, move our students forward. The interventions are more targeted toward the specific skill that a student uh, is demonstrating a need with. And it may be a skill that we, the student will need to work on for uh, several weeks. So the interventionist will actually set a timeline for a, about how long do we think it will take the student to demonstrate that skill. They will develop goals for the student and they will track the progress of that student over time. And then at some point, if, the, if it's not the classroom teacher, they'll sit with the classroom teacher to determine whether or not they've met the goal. Is this the right intervention? If, if not, then what else do we need to do to support students? Um, or did they meet the goal and how else what other supports are needed. So it's, it's much more targeted to a specific skill and um, tracked in a different way than a tutoring might be. Um, I wanna thank you for the presentation. I just have a couple of questions just for my own understanding. I'm kind of intrigued about this acceleration, not remediation concept. It, if I could, say it, it sounds a little bit like social promotion to me. I'm trying to understand how, if you take a look at the grade five black farm students in math and they're at 29.4%, that means they're missing or not understanding something about 70% of the work. How is it that they're going to be able to move forward without having first gone back to the foundational skills? I guess that's what I'm really concerned about is foundational skills that they need in order to move up. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yes, I, I, that, I think it's our natural instinct when we see data that looks like this to want to meet the student where they are. Um, we've been looking at a lot of research around how we address learning and schools and school districts that just started students at the grade level and filled in where necessary and that's where the planning is really critical. That's where the studying the data to really understand what the student needs and that's where we say it's not a one size fits all. But if we're going to start here 
understanding that we're going to have to fill in where students need some of those foundational skills. We may need to start the lesson with some foundational learning, and then we're going to move on to that grade level instruction. And that is also why the tutoring or the intervention is necessary to, for those students who are, are, are really behind. We're going to kind of marry them. So we'll keep moving in the classroom at grade level, and we're also going to, to fill in uh, at additional times. So both really need to happen for um, many of our students to move. But the studying of the data, and that's why we talk about that informal data and why it's so critical for them to study that and have those conversations with their teams about where they start is going to be really critical. Do you want to add? So then with regard to the tutoring, at one point you said if the, the teachers could not support it that you would go outside the building. I guess my question is, and this comes from my own experience in trying to help my grandson with a math problem and was told I was doing it all wrong. Are the tutors going to be trained in the, the, the way of Eureka and Benchmark? Because he made it very clear that I was not doing it the Eureka way when I was trying to teach him 12 plus 8, you know? Yes. I understand that very much. Uh, yes, they will be trained. We actually um, put out an RFP in August, and we had 26 external vendors submit uh, uh, responses, interest in supporting our students with tutoring. And one of uh, the requirements is that they would go through training through MCPS if they wanted to participate. And so we will train them in Eureka, Mathematics, Learn Zillion, Study Sync, and Benchmark. Well, thank you. I'm going to be watching this acceleration, not remediation, because while I think it's good mentally and emotionally for the students to, to be on grade level, I wonder if it could not also backfire if they're not as successful as some of the other students because their foundational skills are not as good. So I want to thank you for the presentation. Doc, uh, Ms. Sylvester, yeah. you have another question? I just forgot to ask something. Um, how does this all play out in our extended school year schools? Because they have more time to do this. Is that they'll, they'll just have more time to implement these strategies? Anything to share about that? Um, in terms of our rolling out the interventions, if they're ready to get started, certainly they can. They will have more time to be able to do some of these strategies. Um, I believe uh, one of the principals shared a few board meetings ago um, how things have, have been going in his school. Um, but yes, they just have more time to be able to implement a lot of the strategies. And of course, we're looking at that, those two schools to really understand what's working well, because they're you know, a few weeks ahead of the other schools. But I, I think in terms of the interventions, they, they'll just have a little more time to implement them. And I think we have to recall that those two schools, Roscoe, Nixon, and Arcola, were identified previously because we knew there were specific needs that, the, that those communities and those students had in terms of their learning progressions. And so the additional time is one of the ways that we're trying to support a school and its community based on the needs that were identified through the data previously. I just wonder if um, you know this is an intervention that we might want to expand given the dramatic learning loss that you can work miracles in the classroom, but you also need more time in order to achieve it. So I just wanted to put that out there. Dr. Daka. Yeah, I just wanted to say that in the summer, I mentioned that we would be doing acceleration and review or remediation at the same time, and I got shot down right away, not by staff. But I think if you don't do that, you lose the students. You know, this is part of their well-being. If they have to do exactly what they did before, and they weren't successful at it, it it's going to turn them off, and we'll have a bigger problem at hand. So I, I appreciate all the things you're trying to do, and you're making a good description, but as Carla says, wouldn't it be nice to have more time to do this instead of before school or during school or after school with all the attendant problems that go with that? So 
I don't know. Let's think about that and see how we might be able to do that. Ms. Harris. Thank you. Um, first, I did want to just, uh, you know, appreciate uh, all the professional development that happened over the summer um, with our staff that are working in our school to support our newcomers, our students with interrupted or limited um, education, our MET students. Um, I think that's so important. Um, and then I did have a question. If, will we get or can we get an update soon about how this process has been used by our special schools, Longview, um, Sandburg, Rock Terrace. Um, I know hearing from staff there last year, they felt that they learned a lot of lessons about how to serve their students better because oddly, they inter year in and year out have students who miss school regularly for other non-COVID reasons, of course, and they found new ways to meet their needs while they were learning from home that they found to be very successful. So how we are using this process to allow them to adapt their strategies to incorporate things that weren't traditionally used but they know now work. Can we get that update? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again for the presentation. This was a lot to, to, to take in, so I'm sure we'll have further questions after we've digested it more. So now we're up to our consent items. Is there any that any board member wishes to pull? Well, can I get a motion to move items six through 6.1 through 6.4 in block? I move 6.1 through 6.4 in block. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. We're up to item seven. Can I move 7.1 through 7.2 in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. Is there any new business? Seeing none, item eight is for information only. And at this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. We are adjourned.